Well, here we are. It's a brand new week and we're starting it on a colorful note, as you can see. Uh, in the red corner, rocking, what color is this again? This is pink. Pink? Yes, just pink. Okay, looks a shade of violet, looks a shade no, of purple. It's pink. Are my eyes deceiving me? What do you guys think? <laughs> I'm in the studio. I know sometimes on the other end it gets a yeah. bit different on the back of the cameras. But whatever it is, we're wishing you a colorful start to the week and a colorful week. Hopefully, everything that you have on your mind that is in consonance with God's will, guess what? Inshallah. Inshallah yeah. will be fulfilled. My name is Benjamin Akako and I do this with... Sweetie Abochi and brand new day, brand new week, but it's still your most trusted breakfast show on the block. You know, in a bit, I'll be serving you the news and then right after that, we'll get into the news review. For today, Dr. K um, Sharif Khalid will be joining us. He's Associate Professor of Economics, so stay for that. After that, you know, Muftan Abil Abdullah will be here to present his segment on AM Sports. And after that, we get into the big stories. We said we're neatly into that because Ghana is set to have access to some $360 million upon the completion of an executive board uh, review. I'm talking about the IMF. Now, this follows a staff agreement reached between the IMF on the one hand and Ghana on the other hand over the weekend. Government says it's committed to keeping a tight monetary policy to ensure the gains made are not derailed. But how much do we know? How has Ghana fared with the IMF so far? Is this sticking till its end of the deal? And what does this new staff agreement mean for Ghana's economy moving forward? We'll hear from some economists on that all-important matter. Later on in the show, you know that peasant farmers are unhappy with the promotion of GMOs, that is genetically modified organisms. They argue seeds from multinational corporations will erode their independence and threaten their livelihoods, affecting food security. So we'll delve into this matter and understand really what's the situation on ground and how or what is the way forward. So join us with your comments, thoughts by phone on all our social media platforms at Joy News on TV. Um, just, just before we go, though, yeah. have you ever had any food with GMF or GMO, you know, genetically modified food or organisms? Have you ever paid I attention? I haven't paid attention. No, I mm. haven't paid attention. Mm. But I realize that the vegetables we have these days are different. Like you see a tomato that's red, but you open it and it's green inside. For some of you those, yeah. sometimes it is because the farmers are doing gymnastics. Do you and know what adding I mean? fertilizers. Spraying stuff on yeah. them, even watermelon. Yeah. But that's a conversation for another day. Stick and stay. Sweetie Abochi will be serving you the news uh, shortly. We'll be right back. Welcome to the program. This is the AM News. Let's begin. Elders, priests and priestesses of the Tema Traditional Council have performed rights to seek justice for two persons who lost their lives Friday night at Tema Newtown during a procession at Pledge Festival that was coming to an end. We will bring you that story later, but in other news, calls for a female running mate for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia have intensified as identifiable groups at the KJTR market in the Ashanti region add their voice to the request. To them, the call that was earlier made by their colleagues at the race course market is justified, hence their involvement. At a press conference, they noted it is about time the new patriotic party improved their strategies towards the agenda to break the eight. Nanai Aljima has more in the following reports. The identifiable groups at the KJTR market were instrumental in campaigning for the NPP flag bearer during the party's presidential primary. To them, their interactions with their customers have revealed readiness of the electorate for a female running mate for the NPP. Though they refused to name their choice, they outlined some qualities of their preferred individual. We've done the religious part of it. We've done the tribal part of it. Now we, we should consider the gender part of it. A female from Ashanti region will be the best option for the party. That's why we are pleading with the executives of the club, our chiefs, our former president, the current president, Anadolan Kwekufuadu, 
they should all come to a, a conclusion and, and choose a female from Ashanti region for us to be the running mate. Okay. We want a female running mate from the Ashanti region. We want someone to champion the interests of women in the region. Women make and keep the home, so we need their input. If a woman partners Dr. Baumia, it will improve his chances. Meanwhile, some members of the NPP in the Ashanti region have joined calls for a female from the region to partner the vice president. Irene Osereko speaks for the group. It is our prayer and we are hoping that a woman should uh, be the running mate for the party. As mothers, a woman plays an important role in marriage and the nation as well. We are pleading the stakeholders or two and four, the president as well, and then Dr. Baumia to consider woman to be the running mate for the party. Now, let me bring you back that story about elders, priests, and priestesses of the Tema Traditional Council who performed right to seek justice for two persons who lost their lives Friday night at Tema Newtown during a procession at Splidio Festival that was coming to an end. They believe the gods and ancestors will help punish those behind this heinous crime. Tema Shipi and Su Secretary of the Tema Traditional Council, Ni Ama Sumpunu II, disclosed this after performing the rites. Two residents of Tema Newtown, 38-year-old Christopher Amu and 22-year-old Joseph Ajay, lost their lives after a shooting incident during a procession as part of the Pledge Festival. Both the residents of Tema Newtown and Ghana Navy have been at variance with the cause of death of the two, as three others continue to receive medical care at Tema General Hospital. The community has blamed Ghana Navy for the death. Ghana Navy has, however, denied any wrongdoing. To seek justice for the dead, the traditional council has performed right by crushing fresh eggs, pouring libation, and others to invoke the power of the gods. Tema Shipi and Stu Secretary of the Tema Traditional Council, Ni Ama Sompunu II, explains that per their custom, it is important to perform the right for the deceased. We are testing the potential of our gods, whether they are alive or they are dead. That's all we are, we are asking for. Similar things, not akin to, akin to this one, but not precisely as this. The way we see things, we will test the potential, whether they are alive or they are also gone. The town was really located to here, but we never love our sovereignty as people of Tema. So we shall continue to test the potential of our gods until justice prevails. We don't have Amoka, we don't have AK-47, we don't have SMG. But we believe in our gods. We are invoking them to come to our aid. Ni Ama Sompunu says the community feels powerless and needs the assistance of the gods to settle the matter. It is no news that people lost their lives through our people's uh, celebrations. It is no news. And it is as a result of people refusing to exercise their discretionary powers. Look, I've been, I'm saying that. Force is also always applied when common sense fails. The incident that happened yesterday could have been avoided if common sense had been applied. Because these people were in the possession, possession, and you know, a car, you are driving your car, and you see a number of people in possession. What do you do? You wait, they pass, and you continue, but you don't drive through them. You, you've been carrying their displeasure and they will react. That's exactly what happened yesterday. Then, because you don't have guns, you start shooting. We are celebrating our festival. Does it make sense? We are invoking our guns. They should come to our aid because we are powerless. Meanwhile, Temanya Dowulomo, Numo Abodade Hamle II, says the incident has marred the festival.
This is a bad omen, losing two lives. We do not accept corpses into the community during this period. So for the two persons to have died takes everything away from this beautiful celebration. We have performed right for the gods to step in. Newtown community awaits outcome of the rights performed. Kwame Yankesh reports for Joy News. Now, in today's business landscape, the advice to waive litigation and instead opt for arbitration in resolving disputes is gaining traction. That's according to law lecturer at the Ghana School of Law and lead consultant for the Robert Smith Law Group, Bobby Banson. Mr. Banson explains that the advantages go beyond saving cost and time, as it also provides a forum where parties can address their grievances effectively or efficiently and with no or less contention compared to traditional court proceedings. It is almost always a win-win for parties involved. In court, there's always a winner, there's always a loser. In arbitration, that hardly happens. As much as possible, the panel will ensure that people's interests, instead of positions, are advanced. That is one. So that you maintain the business relationship between the parties and there's a resolution as to the issues. Right. Two, deals with the speed. Mm -hmm. So that once it is arbitration, you're able to determine the timelines within which you resolve the dispute. Right. So that you can decide to say, this one, within three weeks, mm. we should be done and done with. And every party is bound by a judgment. In fact, for lack of a better word, I dare say better than a court judgment. <laughs> the reason being that with a court judgment, if it's a high court, mm. or assuming it's a district court, you have a right of appeal to the Supreme Court. Mm. But when it comes to arbitration, there's no right of appeal against the award. But you can challenge the award on very, very limited grounds right. under Section 58 and 52, I believe, whether it's domestic or international. Right. The Ghana School of Law lecturer also highlights another crucial advantage arbitration offers, which is the confidentiality and flexibility it offers the disputing sides. It is one thing that really encourages arbitration. Mm. Because with court, your matter is out there. <laughs> Any person can walk to the courtroom to listen to your case. Mm -hmm. But with arbitration, you decide who sits in the course of the proceedings. And so your, even the award is not published, except with the consent of the parties. So if I start arbitration with something, mm. nobody else will know that I have an arbitration with something. But if I have a court case with something, anybody can go to the registry and do a search. Is there a case involving something, Ladi? Can I get copies of all the processes that is filed? Our TI bill mm. will entitle the person to get it. But with arbitration, no. You cannot, Private. It's every, you cannot publish anything relating to the arbitration, even the final award, unless with the consent of all the parties. Mm. So that confidentiality is, is very, I know a lot of multinational companies, uh, let me see, without mentioning names, those that engage in exclusive distributorship agreements, mm. they always insist on arbitration, right. because if they have a distributorship agreement with you and they terminate it, especially in the telecom sector. They, ter they terminate it, and then tomorrow they give it to somebody else and you commence arbitration. That person will not know the nature of the award that was delivered mm. so that they cannot use it as judicial precedent. All right. You come and say, ah, when you did this, you awarded this, so let me... And a lot of com businessmen mm. are in favor of that confidentiality provision. Pay cocoa farmers well to reduce environmental pollution from the Galamse menace. Words from Nene Tete Akura I, Penua of Manya Krobo, as he criticizes the government for neglecting significant environmental pollution caused by illegal mining, popularly known as Galamse. He suggests that fair compensation for cocoa farmers would incentivize them to continue farming and thus decrease environmental degradation. His remarks were made at the inaugural Africa and Diaspora Development Initiatives on Environment and Climate Action in Pong in the Eastern Region. My colleague, Carlos Caloni, has more in this report. Held under the theme Sustain Ecosystem Health, Pathway to a Green Future, the event organized by the African Millennium Heritage Foundation convened environmentalists, students, practitioners, and traditional leaders 
to discuss Africa's response to climate change. Dr. Lloyd Manotti of University of Environment and Sustainable Development in his keynote address emphasized the agency of adopting eco-friendly practices to reduce pollution. Pollutants, again, such as pesticides, weedicides, fungicides, damage nutrients and, eco and microorganisms in the soil that must sustain it. Dumping of toxic, non-degradable plastic wastes, absorbents, and acrylic materials pollute the soil. Soil pollution harms humans through the food chain once again. One may ask, can we protect and sustain the natural environment? The simple answer is, yes, we can if the fight for its sustenance is head on. I must say it must be head on. And the solutions to go. Sustainable agriculture, sustainable agriculture. Yes, we must farm, but must do so sustainably by avoiding harmful practices and toxic substances that damage the natural environment. We must also practice organic farming and patronize organic products. Founder and director of the African Millennium Heritage Foundation, Evelyn Bochui, describes Ghana's current environmental pollution levels as alarming. She emphasizes the need for stringent policies to regulate chemical usage in the mining sector. And when you look at the petro petroleum sectors, you look at what is happening today in Galamse. Uh, for instance, it's heartbreaking. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit Takrade and crossing the Pra River, uh, I, I just cried. You know, the use of uh, mercury and all that is really polluting. The, our health system is not better. We need a better green future for our children. The specific uh, steps we are hoping the government to take is to bring out policies that will actually help strategize the use of chemicals or mercury in, uh, for instance, in the, the fight of Galamsin for our water bodies because all the fishes in the, in the, in the seas get back into us and uh, it's killing us. So we're really hoping, especially for that sector, for them to work hard, bring policies that will, will, will strategize and streamline how um, mining actions, you know, can be better, can be done better in a, in, a, in a green way. I think when it comes to this mining sector, I think we're not doing much. We can do better. Laws are already there, so they need to enforce the law. Nene Tete Akura the first, divisional chief of Manyakrobo, representing the corner of Manyakrobo traditional area, has said that the government lacks commitment to combat the Galamse miners. He advocates for fair compensation to cocoa farmers to deter them from selling their farms to illegal miners, thereby mitigating environmental destruction. If the government is committed, I don't think so, because Galamse is spoiling everything, Galamse. Just look at our lands. Now, when you go to some of the villages, it's like because of money, now things have been like degrading the, the forest, cutting down trees. Cocoa, that is our backbone, is now going. If the cocoa board, the government will pay the farmers well, I think all these things will be done. When you take good care of them, I don't think they will sell their lands. Participants also highlighted the impact of climate change and urged authorities to take proactive measures. For Joy News, Carlos Caloni, Bon, in the Eastern Region. Survivors, on that note, we wrap up the AM News. Up next is a news review. Stay with us. Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to get into the newspapers. And right before we do, 
Let me just let you know. As always, I'm almost like asking me, am I at the segment where I'm bremen Yeah, from Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us bring you the segment. And they're offering, as always, prostate screening for free if you're a man. If you're about 40 and you don't know, you have no idea what is going on with your prostate. <laughs> One day you could wake up with lots of complications. And it's not going to be ple uh, you know, pleasant. So find some place, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, and get yourself checked. If you're a woman and you've not checked out your fertility, you don't know what's going on as far as whether you're fertile, infertile, and yes, women can have that too, or what your status is, you could be playing with fire. Again, I prefer for you Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. And here's the good thing. They have branches dotted across the country. You can reach out to them if you're here in Accra at Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard. In Kumasi, there's Krono Mabwe here, behind the Angel Educational Complex. Then there's Takra Dianaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Asia Manzama. Their call lines are 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. But joining me in the studio, my colleague Sweetie Abochi is here. And uh, we also have in the studio Professor Sharif Khalid. Uh, he's been coming every now and then. He joins us in the studio. Sometimes I get confused whether I should refer to you in reference in respect to uh, economics or accounting. Which one? No, it's more of accounting and finance, but um, okay. there's the interlinkages. But there are the interlinkages, yeah. Economics, I mean, yeah. Well, we, used to, we, we say we are more contemporary than economists. Economists are often... 10, 20 years behind. I see. This shade you are throwing, eh? Me, I have no problem with. <laughs> but it's when you are off the set. That is when you deal with it. In fact, All you right. may start getting messages. That's <laughs> no, economists would agree. That, that's what it is. They, they will agree, yes, eh? Yeah, I was 10 years behind reality. And that's why we are always in this situation. It, that's why, you know, I want to dissociate myself from these yeah, comments so that, that later you can deal with prof. Accountants uh, and the, finance people will tell you we deal with reality. We are forward looking. Right. Yeah. Anyway, right before we come to you and take your brief thoughts, um, Sweetie, how was your weekend? Anything uh, interesting that happened? No, my weekend was fun. It was fun? <laughs> yeah, it was just... Uh, but that's something that happened. Serious. No, nothing that I want to share here on this show. Uh, it was oh. low-key, but fun and exciting. I see. I, I, I heard about the... Um, I saw the story yesterday on mm. the news about the two... The traditional, Tema traditional council performing those rights. And I remember thinking to myself, why do we still do this? Naked women walking on broken glass. But I understand that it's their tradition and their way of avenging the death of these two people. So that's the only thing that has stuck in my mind, you know, this morning, wondering, are we, I thought it's the 21st century. Why are we still doing this? But, you know, it's culture. You cannot take that away from us as a people. Is it? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's their way so, of so, asking the gods to um, revenge or avenge the death of the two people who lost their lives. Let me tell you. Only because it was a festive period. Some people will say, oh, when the Ashantis do certain things, there are certain things mm. uh, Asante Man does, mm. and it borders on what I don't think should be done. Okay. Some you would see the Gars also do, some you'd yeah. see the Evers do. Yeah. I mean, hmm, Trokosi. You know, in a way, yeah. some people still find a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. That is <laughs> uh, FGM, thanks be to God, it's pretty much on the low side. But some people, you know, attempt it every now and then. And child marriage, you know, so uh, yeah. the, all yeah. the, some of these things. Culture is culture until at some point you realize that it's something makes no sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we respect the cultural practices and values of all groups in Ghana. But those that we feel are seriously bordering on, I think eventually they will fade out. Hopefully. Working word being eventually, hopefully. because I think we are getting there. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, but let me, let me come to you now. Um, I mean, any, if anything interesting happened over you, your weekend, we'd like to hear. But then you have a minute and a half or two, as always, to vent on something crucial, something burning on your chest. Well, I mean, I, I think mm. I'd go for the latter because uh, my weekend was just very quiet. I was home. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Much of it I needed to rest because I've been crisscrossing the country, left, right, and center. So I was quite tired. I was actually even meant to travel, but sometimes the body needs rest. So I decided right. to stay indoors much, right. much of it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, uh, before I walked into the studio, I don't know if, it, if uh, the story I saw on the news uh, mm. headlines, any of these papers captured it because it was, uh, I think it read like uh, UCC and uh, Winneba students 
uh, uh, the impact of so, uh, energy yeah. crisis. And I yeah. think that if authorities uh, in mm -hmm. higher public office who are meant to have the national grid running smoothly and providing power or electricity to key institutional essential services, uh, living in denial and telling us that this is, we're not in doom so and, uh, you know, casting allegations. And yet we have students who've come out to express this, university students mm. who are having the discomfort and impact of uh, this, then I think it's most unfortunate. And mm. for me, this is really something I, I'm really venting about. I'm fretting about it. I think it's, it's unfair to the students and something ought to be done about it. Because I, I do remember in, in most instances back <coughs> in the day, probably in, in, in the early 2000s when we had power crisis, and some other time I can't fairly remember, you'd realize... You know, people you, often, often forget yeah, that in the early 2000s like, yeah. we did. Yep. Long before, long before. And, and that's why it kept... In fact, from Rawlings, yeah. from Rawlings's era, there no. used to be some of that, but not so. But you see, gradually, gradually. it became a monster. Yeah. That's how, that's how yes. we got to... And I, got to I, the, yes. Uh, 2013, thereabouts. Then you would realize that sometimes university campuses are being, or some educational institutions are being spared mm. of this. But if they are unable to spare these institutions, it tells you the gravity of the situation that we are being faced with. Right. And uh, then again, I don't know what internally these universities are, are doing, because uh, if they've got standby generators, to actually power some lecture rooms uh, to get them, to get students to at least have uh, some reading time uh, after lectures, it, it'll be. But I mean, looking at the unbearable heats as well, I think that it's just not a right time to be having. So, as crisis. a student, you probably can't, let's say, you can't use your laptop. Your Maybe laptop. it's run out of juice. Yeah. If you went to Balm or something, yeah. because I'm an alum, yeah. alumnus of that institution, I'll go there. Maybe it, it will still be a bit iffy for you. You can't use the gadgets. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting there, you may feel hot. You go to your room, you will still feel Even hot. If the university you may... try to, you know, <clears throat> absorb this by providing gen sets and mm. many other So, plants. Maybe. On plants, yeah. Mm. You would realize that the rooms are still going to be cramped because you have few rooms that can be powered and uh, you have a lot of people going in there to do... And I was just about to get to that and you know, because then... Again, with a lot of congestions in our accommodation facilities with students mm. as well, I just think it's going to be very unbearable. The final point I'll make on that right before we get into the papers. Yeah. You know, uh, there's also this bit about the universities and how they... You were talking about IGF, yes, internally IGF. generated yeah. funds. Yeah. Most of them, the public, are semi-autonomous in a way. There's, but then it becomes problematic because sometimes where they expect government to come through, you're fully aware. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Things that should have been done years ago yeah. are still not done. That's why at the University of Ghana, hostel facilities and the funding of them has been a major... So, ordinarily, you'd expect that they would be able to raise some money to be able to no, take care of some of these things. But, but it becomes see, but problematic. You, you can, we can't just rely on IGF. I know a lot of people go into the nitty gritties of IGF without really understanding what it is. Mm. Because uh, when we talk about IGF, we're talking about internally generated funds. You exactly. know, have workshops being run, some specialist programs, among other things. Mm. What you realize is that the lecturers or the resource persons are delivering beyond that allocated time, mm. right? So they also need to be, you know, remunerated yeah. in a way. I mean, you look at all of these initiatives that even universities have made. Go and see the legal tussles they are involved with. Mm. You know, when they have this BOT idea of uh, build, operate, and transfer to have uh, hostel facilities, they bring management uh, firms to actually, or, you know, facility management firms to look after these. They fall out and sometimes they are embroiled in a lot of legal tussles. So to be reliant on IGF, I think that it's not the way forward. No, I'm not saying reliant, yeah, but, but sometimes... No, I think people should not be bringing IGF into the equation. Why not? Yeah, because it, government, are you talking particularly when it comes to doom so? Yes, particularly when it comes to doom so, because... But, but you mentioned it earlier. That was only why I was expatiating. No, what I'm saying is that they go the extra mile okay. to provide this to say, okay, well, right. we have a plant for, let's say, BAM Library. Can we okay. have a, a plan for an L-shaped lecture theater or something? But even that is not enough because you have a lot of students. Or even the Jones Quarty building because yeah. it has part of the accounting yeah. section there and yeah. all of so that. So what do you do all of make? that? So I just think that, yes, um, mm. government needs to step in, right? I mean, but if there's smooth power supply, which everyone is expected to have, we'll not even be having an idea. Of maybe, they should, maybe they should give the, <laughs> yeah. the educational institutions a timetable. Uh, Cynthia Mochi, let's get into yeah. your papers first. But Ben, did you watch the story? <clears throat> the energy minister would not want to hear this. Mm -hmm. uh, which one? Wise, which one? I mean, the story about doom, so you see... Ah, but there is there. darkness. What, what, Are they safe? Anyway. 
<laughs> and they cook with electrical stoves. You know, they don't they no longer use LPG in the dormitories yeah. because of security reasons. Yeah. Again, yeah. so these students are unable to cook meals. They cannot be secure when they are moving from point A to B because everywhere is dark. Again, we are forgetting anyway. the economic impact of this as well because mm -hmm. if you can't store food as a student in the freezer that you could warm up, it means that you are buying a lot from outside. How much do they... But, but you, know, you know a lot of these gadgets are illegal <laughs> when you are... Unless maybe you are in some of the hostels that mm. allow illegal. for... Uh, in a way, because, I mean, the traditional halls, as far as I remember, <clears throat> for the sake of electricity bills and all of that, some of these gadgets were not... Technically oh. not... At our time, it was the only ones um, that were actually approved. You couldn't use LPG. I mean, oh, from, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, LPG, so LPG is to... because there could be oh, explosions okay. yes. and stuff. So, so that's my alma mater. I, I can see and the we, bias in the yeah. passion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's <laughs> like you then. Yes, yes, yes. So, I understand what they are going yeah. through. And when it gets dark, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so, so many bushy areas. Okay, let's get into the newspapers because <laughs> apparently there's no doom. So, what are we talking about? What are we even talking about? Mm -hmm. Let me start from the Daily Guide newspaper. There's a story here on the front page. Um, Tema Youth Navy Clash, two dead. Let me get right into it. Benjamin drew my attention to that story. I know you have a lot to say on that, so let me get into it before I come to you. <laughs> now, two civilians have tragically lost their lives after a group of individuals launched an attack on the Tema Naval Base of the Ghana Armed Forces. The deaths of these two individuals were confirmed in a press release issued by the Ghana Armed Forces on April 13th, detailing the events that transpired, leading to the civilians' fatalities. Now, as per the statement signed by the Director General of Public Relations, Brigadier General E. Agri Kwashi, a vehicle belonging to the Eastern Naval Command um, of the Ghana and Navy was assaulted by a crowd participating in the Kbeleju Festival at Tema Newtown around 7.53 p.m. on Friday, resulting in a significant damage to the vehicle. Additionally, three naval personnel aboard the vehicle sustained severe injuries and were promptly transported to the naval, uh, Tema Naval Base Medical Center for urgent medical attention. Amidst the confrontation, three suspects were apprehended by the naval personnel and subsequently handed over to the Tema Newtown District Police for further investigation. The press release further stated that a mob suspected to be part of the participants in the festivities later attacked the Tema Naval Base with stones and other implements with the aim of releasing their colleagues. Benjamin Akaku. Um, so, quick details about this story. Uh, I, I got a call this morning from someone who's been in the military before on the back of this, and that, you know, some of the reactions mm. are not the way to go, yeah. that the military. You know, there's that fine line between the military and civilians. Mm -hmm. Mind you, though, the head of all our institutions, security uh, institutions in the country, is a civilian. Yes. The president, commander-in-chief yes. yes. of the armed forces. Yes. Uh, so it's a fine line. Then there has been the, the offering of libation. We often say pouring, but it's not. The offering of libation and all of that. I, I, I just want to leave it at this point. Mm -hmm right now but i think the the interface between the military and civilians mm -hmm. oh especially over the last maybe things have happened before i don't know whether you recall that incident where a boy was tied to a tree and i think something melted on his body and lashed and many many years ago we did something on that yeah. but these brutalities you remember Ashaiman? Yeah. you remember other things i think that interface because usually a civilian would see a soldier or someone in the military and think a certain way gradually it is getting eroded, and that's dangerous. Yeah. Especially if you look at yeah. the reaction. It's very bold. Don't the reaction of the civilians. Yeah. So they go and stone the, the, the naval office. So, I mean, the th there's a lot to watch. Defense minister, minister for the interior, among others. The I think there's security. a lot that we have to do, yeah. and even in terms of reorienting Ghanaians on well, this I mean, uh, But, Benjamin, uh, sometimes they are remote causes to some of these issues and immediate causes, right? Mm. So, I mean, we are... We are not in very good times economically in the country. Mm. So you have all of this pent up anger in people. Mm. So when they get an opportunity, they unleash it in different ways. A little ways. trigger. Yeah, a little trigger. They try to unleash it in different ways. But we may think, OK, well, this is the immediate cause of it. But there may be a remote cause to it. But I do agree that we're bridging that gap. You know, we, we emerge from the ashes of military regime, right, where people, where people were very fearful of soldiers. But if mm. you count back, 
I mean, with, with, with no disregard to anyone too, the Gen Zs, these are people who probably never witnessed or had the folk tale of being told what happened during this era, right? So they, they have no appreciation. You have such a smirk on your face, <laughs> Because <laughs> so the, lots of these Gen Zs don't even know. Yeah. What. So you, so the point. Yeah. So the not point all of them. Is, yeah. Not all of them. Yeah. So the yeah. point is, they they were not. They don't live in the shadow of that fear to have seen brutalities that have happened. So yes, yeah. it's eroding. But my point also is that I don't know why we are so quick to release the military when the police. Yeah. Should be doing most of yeah. these activities. Huh? Yeah. It looks like we, we misplace the role of the military. Remember Ejisu and other places. Some places people said, listen, said, yeah. once once you see the military, yeah. they don't go in and do what the police does. The police. Yeah. They go in and, and their thinking, their orientation is very different. And if you're preview to sometimes uh, COVID national security operations, right. sometimes by our, by our work we may come across some of these things, you realize that the military step in sometimes to you know, as it may stage an operation mm. so they can allow the police to come in to calm things. Mm. Most often than not, they get it wrong, right? Mm. They, any, they get in, either go for the wrong people, right? And mm. it triggers and escalates yeah. to another level. So I think that the coordination, it, it just tells you also that uh, our national security setup needs to be, you know, to activate these anti nine operations. It needs to be a lot more savvy, right? But again, culture plays a role here and traditional values. Mm. I think that, I don't know how we are indoctrinated when it comes to our cultural display of festivals, funerals for chiefs mm. and all of these things. I remember during the Easter festivities, my brother's family visited them in Sinyani and I apparently, I don't know, there was a funeral uh, ceremony for a chief that had died. And they would lock up shops and if you wore a red dress or something that didn't mm. wear something that reflected what you had to wear for that week to mourn, you were being attacked. Okay. Right. So I, I don't think our culture permits that. And I don't think that our culture, when we, you know, institute all of these curfews, I don't know where they find place in our laws. Mm. If we want to go back to revise them, I think traditional council, you know, local chiefs, and the government needs to sit in to see if we can actually do, uh, marry our customs with our laws said that we can have sanity. I'll, I'll, that, I'll, I'll just say this to, to yeah. conclude on, on this matter so we move into other yeah. stories. I feel, having observed for a long time, mm -hmm. and it's, it's um, how would I say it, it's epitomized in this whole 12-year-old, 16-year-old's purported marriage, whether to a spirit, yeah. a god, yeah. or a... Yeah. There is a certain disconnect mm. between, or dichotomy, between culture, tradition, mm. and the law. And gradually, we are heading for a, a you know, head-on collision. Yeah. Like you just mentioned. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes you see, okay, and then uh, a traditional ruler has died, and the rights yeah. and everything, yeah. and you're wondering, is that this is really legal, that thing they are doing? Well, even if and this, and then sometimes, it, be, yeah. oh, it is culture and all yeah. of that. Yeah. It, it must be very clear. As of now, mm -hmm. it is not so clear. Yeah. It may be clear in the law. Yeah. It is not clear in, in practice. In practice. And again, I mean, you, you, you trace back to uh, even uh, Western cultures, right? We, there were marriages by betrothal in royal families and like, there's no justification whatsoever. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that if we want our culture to be, to marry within our uh, existing laws, we need to have an engagement. All right. Let's so, and make things very clear. Right. Because at some point, uh, you know, the respected uh, uh, near... I go to. I think he was making right. some defense for the whole of these issues, saying that it was marriage by betrothal. I don't yeah. know. On top of my head, I can't think about the legitimacy of marriage by betrothal. I, I think the law, the law is very clear, clear on, on it. So I don't the know if any justification could be given to that. But I think that if we need to have an engagement to actually fuse this within our law and bring sanity, I think that engagement ought to be held. Rather than trying to trying walk to, the yeah, fine line yeah, and put yeah. the foot, I wanted to use that word today, put the foot around the lines and not yeah. to offend. Any, any particular <laughs> reason you wanted to use that <laughs> word this morning? Because it came up again yesterday in my readings. <laughs> and I thought okay. the last time I used it, Benjamin repeated it in a way that made it seem some way. Well, the point so, is... Well, hopefully you're not pussyfooting with the next story. Yeah. In, in a very sensitive world, such words can also... Or such nice expressions could cause you trouble. I remember, you know? I remember <laughs> in a communications <laughs> class, uh, one of my Sorry friends... to make it brief. Yeah, yeah. almost failed. Uh, because this, there was a feminist who was a lecturer, nothing against her whatsoever. Yeah. And uh, this lad went like, used the term loosely that uh, the media were fingered in this. And she got very offended. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, in the 21st century, using them 
such terms loosely yes. could actually <laughs> cause some trouble. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've been following this story about antiretroviral drugs and the rest from Global Fund that have been stuck at the ports for some time. I think this is the story on that. MOH clears 14 essential medicine containers from ports. The story is on page 3 of the Daily Guide newspaper. The Ministry of Health has completed the process for the release of 14 essential medicine containers at the Tema port. These were from the 182 containers with essential medicines for antiretrovirals, um, tuberculosis and malaria treatment donated by Global Fund locked up at the Tema port. So the clearing of these essential medicines follows calls by the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana and other organizations. Quote, today 14 containers of health commodities comprising 10 containers of malaria RDT containers, one container of malaria injection, three containers of malaria medicine will be delivered to a warehouse. That is according to Chief Director of the Ministry of Health, Al Haji Hafiz Adam, he said. Now, he said the 14 containers cost about 17 million Ghana cities to clear, adding that they contain non-medicine commodities such as bed nets and rapid diagnostic tests. Um, quick reactions on the story. I think that I'm just, I'm happy that uh, Pharmaceutical Society made a call, made raised awareness about the nature of this um, you know, our medicines going mm. bad at the expense of people who actually need it. Mm. And the Ministry of Health has taken a step, a step, because they've not cleared all the containers. It's just a part of it. So mm. I'm glad that they've heeded to their calls and they've seen that there's a need to actually release these drugs and um, accommodate the, the monies involved. So they've paid, they've paid 17 million Ghana cities to clear these number of containers. Well, I mean, should we have to make noise? For ah, some of these things to be done. But that is where we are. They were there for over 11 years. months. I mean, yeah. it, it was just 11 and, months? And, and counting. Yeah. But I'm wondering, I mean, if we can go around town exempting foreign businesses, giving them tax reliefs and tax holidays, giving Waivers. them free zones, uh, mm. licenses, and, and we can't clear our own and we can't, goods. You know, clear our own Mind medicine. you, these are, medicine. these are medications yeah. for crucial tuberculosis. People don't know that tuberculosis is actually yeah. very widespread. Yeah, and that once you get it, it's yeah. probably a lifelong process yeah. of dealing with it. Yes. Malaria kills yeah. many more people in Sub-Saharan yeah. Africa yep. Than, yep. than most of the yep. other diseases. Mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS, it, the, the numbers are spiking again and and my point is like you know hiv and aids it's even at a time where there is less funding in the educational aspect of it i mean growing up we saw like massive yeah, the adverts billboards adverts so yeah. they were like primarily investments in this sector but ever since uh, donor funded agencies withdrew from this we have not made that conscious effort as a government or as a nation but it's critical because what i always tell people and what we don't understand is that when there's economic hardship there's a health crisis staring at us. Mm. Why that is because is that you still have entertainment booming in the country. So the entertainment is booming in the country. It means that a lot is happening socially mm. as well. So right. after you emerge from the ashes of this economic hardship, it's a big health crisis that stares at you. How are we prepared to deal with all of these things? And then again, these are essential services. You know, you have uh, critical medical staff like nurses, doctors, lab technicians who are dealing with HIV patients and could probably have pricks and all of that. Yeah. They use all of this for prophylaxis and prevention purposes yeah. if they had a prick and within 48 hours or 78 hours, they need to fix something. So if they don't have these essential medications, it means that we are even putting our own health system in terms of personnel at risk in a time where we have mass exodus. Mm. Of health workers. Well, as so for that one, yeah. if we want to talk about it, we'll never, so, we'll never finish. I, I don't know the kind of thinking we bring yeah. into all of these things. Mm. You know. are, are you done with your stack yeah, of papers? I just want to do some headlines mm. and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on mm. to you. Seven die in Galamse pits. Mm. This country shall not fail. That's an editorial. Um, Kwabena Boateng wins a Jesu NPP post and was it Yante? She fell sick during the campaign season. All eyes on Israel respond. He actually fell Iran. sick right before the polls. It, it uh, didn't seem to uh, do him much good, though. Yoko bounces well, I, from I really the wondered why he ran. Road contract corruption allegation. If you want more story, there are more stories in the Daily Guide newspaper. Pick one for would you. Would you like to do maybe uh, the yes? The you find, find, a, new find a newspaper. Performance struck a 74 omitted project added. <laughs> 67 wrong entries deleted. Looks like there's some editing going on on this performance tracker. Alan you know, promises you know my, my, <laughs> my bit is, you know, I, on Friday with my yeah. blunt thoughts, yeah. I, was, I was laughing a bit because we had gone through parts mm -hmm. of the tracker. Mm -hmm. And what was, listen, if your tracker is not ready, don't, don't why do we like rushing 
things, performance tracker to show what some of the projects within Agenda 111, two of them were not even in there, in there. plus myriad others. What, and you see, when you do this... But nowhere near even 50% complete. We did our own research and realized that some of the things in there didn't add up. Isaac Kofi J, mm. Anthony Menu, and, and team. And I'm asking myself, why do we like doing this? Is it, what do you hope no, to achieve? And in the end, you make yourself look bad. Yeah. But I think it's election year. They want to make themselves look good. No, but actually, actually, there are some gullible Ghanaians who if, actually believe that these politicians are doing so well. Oh my yeah. God, they launched a performance track. Well, well, well don't, don't necessarily use the word gullible because people have their own. You know, they may. But but my point is, if you want to make yourself look good, stick to the facts. Yeah. No, but the point is, when when we uh, do this, it makes you look bad. Benjamin, so you, you and I, we if, understand. If you do great, everybody if you do great, do you need a performance tracker? Uh, and that is what I have always said. Yeah, you don't need that. If you're doing the right thing, the right listen, thing, the people will feel it. If if <laughs> right. if the person has some good money, is doing well, and and is taking care of his bills, yeah. no matter what that other person out there will say, is like, hey, yeah. master, don't talk about the economy. No, no, no. I'm feeling okay. But when it is down, and you say, like the vice president said, the fundamentals will expose you. Mm. When the person in the pocket <laughs> can't feel, and you are telling no, me I, that. I see, oh, we are doing so much I better. I see more Obviously. of a political exercise because you remember uh, the vice president now, uh, flag bearer, mm. when he spoke at, the, at UPSA. Mm. He did mention that in a few days to come, there's going to be a performance tracker yes. to sort of evidence his IT yeah. uh, digitalization yeah. And yeah. agenda. Yeah. So in their rush, but what they should know is that IT takes a lot of incubation period. So if you're really an IT guru, you should know that you don't rush it. Mm. Right? Uh, so, unless of... Uh, you, and your prototypes, which I believe was a prototype, it's not what you released to the public. Maybe this is right. the point. Finally, you have to stress test it. And yeah, right. Yeah. Maybe this is the point where I'd like to welcome all of you to our yeah. digital studios. Okay. <laughs> we are digital, though. We. You are, all right. So you've joined the digital. What's a, so yes, what a solid team. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to get into What's a solid studio? I realized that, yeah, solid studio. I realized right. that it's on all the headlines, so I'll pass it to you to do it. All right. The 360 million IMF third uh, tranche booked. So yeah. Yes, so maybe let's, let's, let's get right into that. We have limited time, about six, seven minutes to go. So uh, maybe you could do the custodian, IMF Lords Government for Economic yeah. Recovery, among others. You see, when, uh, when we come to issues of IMF and the World Bank, you'll never see an IMF program. If they poop on their own program, how is it going to be successful? You get it? So an IMF program, what I would say is, look, let's listen to the optics of it in terms of what happens, the reality, the engagement, and what the conditionalities are. So far, what I said in this was that when you have an IMF program, there's a certain expectation of the public and the business community, mm. right? We used to be very consistent. We know when a tranche is coming in. Mm. And by that, businessmen, right, who were hoarding their monies and didn't want to pump it in will know that, okay, once X number is injected into the country or into the economy, the city is going to perform. Right. So at that time, the city compared to the dollar would have strong parity then they go into the market or the forex market to do their transactions. But this is a very peculiar, it's an outlier when it comes to IMF programs. We missed deadlines, we made tranches, right? And it disrupted the market. So what happens is that those expectations were not there. Coupled with the fact that a COCO syndicated loan as well fell through. Mm. So what it means is that we now have a very erratic market that cannot be gauged as far as an IMF program is concerned. Mm. So what it does is that for me, apart from the tick box exercise and sort of the measures that may put, be put in place for prudent spending, the program does not, have not, you know, birthed its real impact. Mm. It would have given the economy to spare some growth, which is why we've been on a program for a couple of months now. Interest rates have not changed or they are not even reflecting on the pockets of the people and the business. Right. The currency is still not doing very well. Right. So I don't know what loud uh, initiative or why, the, what, what praise the IMF is giving out here. In what light or within which context? I think that's what we need to know. But yes, I can understand that, yeah, the government needs to make some noise about it. Because which is why you have, um, so this for me, again, sitting from an, a trend, right? A, not Number of papers. So this, this seems like a sponsored government initiative. Mm. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It seems like a, a sponsored government initiative to, you know, to splash that in the face of people, which again, but this is what they should have done a very long time ago <clears throat> in terms of actually getting the expectations of people. But if you couldn't negotiate the program, and for me, again, this is a very peculiar IMF program, right? When you have 
like few months ago, also sometime last month, you had mm. the IMF boss herself with yeah. critical staff flying into the country on a weekend. Weekend, yeah. Right? And those of us who are watchers of the markets and the multinational and multilateral space felt that there was more than meets the eye in that engagement. Because on a weekend, why are you flying into town? And the engagement... What do you was, think? What do you and think? the engagement was with what, key principal officers of our economies, the central bank, governor, and his deputies. Mm. Then you have the minister and the deputies, and then chair of the economic management program. Mm. So I think that there were probably some conditionalities that they were pushing to be met. Again, uh, watchers or probably speculators of the market could say it probably has something to do with a bill. That was before the president to accent and the tussle within parliament. Yeah. Right? These are you know, speculations mm. that are coming. So I don't know what has been done to the bill and what the tussle between parliament and the executive has been that they say it's coming. Let's see when it arrives and what impact it would have on the economy. Well, time will tell as far as all, the, all of these are concerned. The and the, the 360. Pudding. Yeah, it's in it's the, in the eating. eating. But, but uh, can we do your next paper unless there's uh, another story you'd like to do from here? I guess a car dealer still, isn't it? So Watch the Daily us. Search Light. Yeah. Car dealers, car dealers challenge Baumi over flat rate. rate. Uh, tax. You see, this, this whole idea of flat uh, rate tax that they are you know, throwing all over the place without really contextualizing it's problematic. And when they do this, they refer to is it, Estonia. Is, is it your flat rate? <laughs> <laughs> no, when they do this, they refer to Estonia, right? And I, I keep saying this Estonia is a country of 1.3 million people. Mm. So if they go for flat rate, it's very easy. To mm. implement more so when they can be deemed as a, a developed country within Eastern Europe, or some people I don't want to use any derogatory term about those of us who understand the economy of Estonia very well. So, if you want to compare flat tax rates, you don't go for a country with 30 plus million people, mm. right, with a semi informal structure compared to a structured, matured economy of 1.3 or 1.2 million people. It's just uh, yeah, so where are they, the whole idea of this flat tax rate thing. But the point is, you want to have flat tax rate. Look at the tax handles we have. Mm. doesn't look like a government that can run flat tax rate. What are you going to do with all the avenues that you've opened? Right. Now you know these um, vehicles that took over the space, or the Uber and uh, Yongo space, uh, the Matis and all of these. You, if you buy it now, I mean, compared to how much it cost back in the day, Right, to this day, and how much it, post, it costs at the port. Because you can't go to Eastern uh, Europe, buy for probably 300, 500 euros. You get to the port. And <laughs> the amount you need to spend yeah. to actually clear it, it's twice as much or more. So I don't know where they are getting this whole idea of flat tax rate from. It's, it's quite problematic. Right. Right, and especially so, uh, this is the same vice president who has been... At, uh, talking about tax amnesty, and again, I even wonder within which context he's coming from with his tax amnesty idea, <laughs> when tax amnesty is actually a revenue collective measure. And the point is, with tax amnesty, what you forget to realize is that once you begin to give tax amnesty, right, it demoralizes those that are obedient taxpayers. And they ask ourselves, okay, if they are doing this, then why don't we also default? In that case, it becomes counterproductive. So you just don't throw about very sensitive initiatives such as taxation. Taxation is a very important subject, and I think that our politicians ought to, because you don't load the tax basket and responsibility and start now to you know, bring a new discussion of flat tax rate that is right. not even within the context mm. of what we're talking about. Well, uh, time will tell, like you said, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yep. And uh, by and by, we'll see how things pan out. Mm. I'll do about one minute, and then we, we have to uh, go. The Ghanaian Times newspaper, IMF bailout and review, uh, second review meeting, Ghana to receive $360 million uh, third tranche. Like you mentioned, all the papers have it. Uh, most of the stories you've already done. I'll just do one story, and same here as well. IMF okays $360 million for uh, Ghana. But this story, Cortis use arrest warrant, and that's the Ghanaian publisher newspaper. Cortis use arrest warrant for Chinese Iron Lady over cantonments land. You know, cantonments has become a place where, honestly, Honestly, I see how you are. <laughs> it, it, but anyway, I'll leave my comments well, for that's later. Our prime. I, I know some <laughs> things that I can't. Um, 
Echo was uh, security challenges, no, but, but then, but ben, a, l l let me just get into the story and then you can come <laughs> in. So a high court in Accra has issued a bench warrant for the arrest of Chinese businesswoman and managing director of DHM Constructions Limited, Weila Deng, who also goes by Xiaohua Deng, Xiaohua Deng, and Wan Shirley Ajua Okran. Deng, known for her multiple identities, has significant, and why does Aisha Huang come to mind? Yeah. Has significant influence within the Yaku Fuadu administration, per the story, leveraging close ties with the key members of the president's inner circle. The two have been evading justice since a contempt proceeding was initiated against them for their unauthorized entry onto a property in cantonments and orchestrating the illegal demolition of a fence wall owned by a businessman who is the applicant in this case. The bench warrant represents the latest development in the ongoing dispute over land and cantonments involving DHM uh, constructions and the businessman. It goes on and on. Uh, you can grab details of that story uh, in the Ghanaian publisher newspaper. We have to go in a minute. Yeah, well, Quick always thoughts. tell us about uh, colonial legacy and how we... Because <laughs> in, in, in most jurisdictions, you don't have the creme de la creme living 1,000 meters away from a national airport. They mm. live far away from it. Right, but here we are. We have in the heart of. Well, what, what are you? What are you implying? <laughs> I'm not implying anything. What are you implying? I'll leave the public to draw their conclusions. Quick action, okay. that, right? But I mean, for me, it's becoming a danger. Have you seen the speaker's residence in cantonments? Right. This is a speaker's residence for security reasons. I'd, like they've sold almost all the government lands around it, mm. and they are building high-rise buildings. Yeah. So what it means is that you, you can, can see right outcome, into see right into the speaker's residence, mm. and this is happening in most of cantonments. Why are we even selling these? If we are selling them, or whatever it is, by understanding of the law is that when you are not using it for a purpose, it ought right. to be, it ought exactly. to revert yeah. to the rightful owners, and they can do what we did. But I think that government can repossess this. We don't even think in. And I just, I made a post on my social media handle. I think, but this has to be your final bit, so we right. go. Right. Uh, we've sold packs, we've sold race courses. We don't even have a single race course in this country now, because you know where Kempiski sits used to be a race course. We've called, I mean, if we had a land park, if we didn't stand up strong, it would have been sold to private investors. Mm. Right. And now we are going around, look at the AMA's, uh, what do you call it? FOIA has become a Deba ground or, you know, event center when we've sold almost every pack in this country. So what, what are we doing when it comes to investments? Just a concrete jungle yeah. we're building for ourselves. When, when you go back to the, the ordinary of... citizens are being pushed to the fringes of this country where they have to, you know, leave Kaswa to come to the ministries to work. All of these cantonment areas could have been high-rise buildings for teachers, for nurses, right. right, for medical doctors who could easily rush to rage, Kualibu and 37 for all of these things. But we are putting them in the periphery. No, please. Which the, I call the dangerous the, 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 periphery. The, I, I think that, that... That is prime land. And most of it is that, foreign owned. That is Not prime land that that's must right. be sold and someone yes, must make a profit. And, uh, uh, um, so that's how we cap off the news. Thank you, uh, Dr. Halid, yeah. for joining the conversation. Thank you so much. Dr. Sharif Halid, he, he is Professor of Economics. And, uh, of course, Sweetie Abochi also uh, joining the conversation with what she calls a pink, a shade of. <laughs> we're still going to have to take a look into that. But right before we go, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us bring you this segment. And uh, today is no different. They're offering you, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free. Reach out to them at any of their branches here in Accra at Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard. Kumasi Kono Mabwe here, behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takradi Anaji State. Tema, Community 22, Tichiman Hanswa, and Esia Manzama. Their call lines 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. It's time now for sports coming your way right up next. <laughs> Welcome back on the AM show. We head into a big story. And like you've been told, Ghana is set to have access to some $360 million upon completion of an executive board review of the IMF. Now, this follows that staff uh, level agreement and discussions have uh, continued. We bring you a conversation on that. Let me just sneak in as well. Uh, I've got some calls and messages, a number of you trying to join the live stream on Joy News on Facebook, we're facing some challenges, specifically on uh, Facebook. So if you can't connect, don't worry. Our technical team is on that. 
they are handling it. And as and when we reconnect, you'll be sure uh, to know about that. Well, let me now introduce the guests who joined me on this all-important conversation. Our economy is primus into Paris for many uh, people where we find ourselves. Seth Tekpe is a former finance minister. He joins the conversation. We also have Dr. Theo A. Champong, a political uh, risk analyst. And we also have, uh, joining the conversation, Professor Elik Blim Komla Agbloyo. He's a professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Um, okay, so I think, uh, okay, now I see Seth Tekbe. Seth, you may have to unmute. Can you hear me, uh, Mr. Tekbe? All right. And then uh, Dr. Theo Champo, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Morning. Great, great, great. Good to have all of you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, loud and clear. We're very appreciative of the fact that wherever you are, you've taken the time to discuss with us uh, this morning. But I'll start with your initial thoughts on the IMF, our program, which the IMF is uh, bankrolling, facilitating. It's been a while now, first tranche, second tranche. Now here we are with a top up of $360 million that we're expecting. We're going through the motions. What is your reading of where we are currently? I'll start with you, Dr. Theo Echampong, before I go to Seth Tekbe and then uh, Prof as well. Dr. Theo Echampong. Yes, uh, again, Ben, a pleasure to be, to be here. So I think generally the program has uh, delivered on the broad um, structural um, and quantitative objectives. Um, so if you look at um, the criteria that the fund um, used to do the assessment of the of the second review, and if you go to the the big document that they published um, uh, about a year uh, ago, by the end of uh, September, they were to have had some strategy to streamline a number of the statutory funds. Uh, we're supposed to also have had uh, the medium term revenue strategy. Uh, approved, um, and then there's other things to do with the um, integrated tax uh, administration uh, system, and then um, expansion of GIFMIS to cover 265 other um, relevant uh, authorities or institutions that uh, generate their own IGFs or internally generated fund. And then there's a couple of other things to do with um, uh, inflation, and you know the deficit and um, things to also do with the uh, the exchange uh, rate and reserves. And if you look at all of those um, indicators, largely as of the end of last year, they had um, begun to improve in relative terms. Still nowhere near the levels that we should be, um, but it did indicate that um, as for the second review, the performance under the program, as the bank um, itself says, has been um, strong. Of course, the challenge which we will come to, I'm sure, later in this discussion is one or two very sticky areas. So, for example, in the energy sector, with what's happening at ECG and the debate now whether it's doomed so or not, and, you know, the inefficiencies that are happening. Also, the cocoa sector, which is also a big issue, uh, as well. And then the third challenge really being whether or not, despite what the finance minister says, uh, they would be able to uh, contain spending um, in, in the election year. But I think overall, from where we sit now, like I said, uh, they have met most of the targets. Uh, thank you, Dr. Theo Champo, for those initial comments. Let me bring in Seth Tekbe. Uh, your reading of, of the issues, development so yeah, far. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, as Dr. Theo Achimpo, you know, mentioned, uh, we may be um, doing well in the interim, uh, in the short term, um, which is what the program, you know, covers. Uh, we may be doing well in terms of uh, particularly the structural and quantitative, sorry, the more immediate uh, criteria that are set. Um, I would caution that even if you look at the program itself, um, the task ahead is daunting. And I don't use that word advisedly. Um, and that is because if you look at the program, 
the performance criteria one is based on primary balance. The calculation of a primary balance, and let me try and simplify it, simply means that um, you are calculating your expenditure, your deficit, which is your expenditure less your revenue, excluding interest, interest payments. Mm. Okay. Um, one, the problem we have is self is debt. And we are excluding one of the critical criteria for calculating, you know, for resolving that problem out of the computation. Secondly, when you use the primary balance instead of uh, the fiscal balance, you are excluding arrears. You would agree with me that another significant problem that we have, including the energy sector and the likely accumulation of, the, of more debt in that sector, in addition to the uh, IPPs who are old and the rest, we are excluding that as well. And then finally, we are, uh, the calculation of primary balance, even the fiscal balance, excludes uh, uh, amortization. Right? Sorry, the primary balance excludes amortization. We include, that is the repayment of debt. So um, when it comes to debt again, uh, all that we are benefiting from now is a suspension of the debt as a result of which the fund is fund's own calculation for from 2025 uh, 25 onwards keeps the debt at 80% plus. And it is only when we are getting into 2028 that the debt goes down to 77%. So the program trajectory itself, right, is not something which uh, should make us complacent with respect to short-term achievements. Why do I say that? Even if you achieve a debt at 70 you know, percent, you are still outside you know, the comfortable zone in which you would return to the markets and assuming you will return to the market and borrow at sustainable rates to be able to finance the deficit. Hello, Mr. Tekpe. All right. Well, we'll get back to him. The domestic what? financial okay. markets. My last point. Mm. Uh, because of the absence of access to the long-term market, both domestic and external, we are relying on uh, on trial balance to finance the deficit dangerously. That has its own danger, which I believe we can discuss in more detail as we go along. So I like us as Ghanaians to look at the need for us to do more for ourselves beyond what the program, you know, is projecting for us, particularly in the short term, because the medium term prospects, according to the data published by the fund, it's still daunting from 2025 you know, onwards. All right. Uh, thank you for those initial comments. Let me come to uh, Prof Agloyo. Uh, your take on development so far. What is your reading of, of the issues? Okay. Good morning once again to you and your listeners. And yeah, I agree with my fellow speakers, Tio and uh, Steph. I think that, I mean, we've demonstrated progress uh, for, the, for us to achieve the SLE. And this SLA will unlock a further $360 million, bringing the total to about $1.56 billion. And that's almost 50% of the promised $3 billion under the ECF agreement. So, so far, I think we've done well. Uh, we've met most of the quantitative targets. Economic growth has been stronger than expected. The fiscal deficit has improved. Inflation has trended downwards from about 54.1%. Our reserve positions have also improved significantly. So this demonstrates progress under the program. But for me, uh, the key risk now is uh, geopolitical risks, okay? Especially given the issues taking place in the Middle East. So if we are not lucky and there's further escalation between Israel and Iran, uh, we could see consequences for the Ghanaian economy, particularly because the dollar is likely to appreciate given that the dollar is a safe haven currency when there is crisis sometimes even crisis originating from the u.s people run to the dollar okay and if the dollar appreciates that is going to put further pressure on on our currency 
again, given that a lot of oil is, is sourced from the Middle East, okay, we are likely to see oil prices also increasing, and that could cause further problems for us. Again, gold prices are likely to increase because gold, gold also serves as a safe haven asset, which may in some way be good for us. But additionally, uh, if there is further escalation in the Middle East, Iran may block the, the Strait of Hormuz, Hormuz, which may lead to supply chain disruptions and can lead to prices in, increases in prices in a lot of consumer goods and services. So for me, at the moment, that's the major risk that can derail uh, what we have achieved so far. In addition, we know that this year is also an election year, and I think so far the government has been measured in its expenditure, trying to keep expenditure under control. And the uh, finance minister said that he will hold the line. I think so far they are doing that very well. Uh, but let's hope that they keep it up and we don't have further escalation in the Middle East. So those would be my initial reactions. I, I, I'm coming back to you, Prof, on, on two major issues, but one merging with what you just mentioned, because we just heard, I mean, the finance minister has been saying that uh, they will not, his ministry will not embark on any extra budgetary spending. In other words, they are going to rein uh, extra spending in. They are going to try to curb that. That has been one of the banes of our economy, even leading to what we all know, where the budget must, must always be financed externally, at least to some extent. But, but the two issues I want to run by you, though I want you to go there as well, uh, Seth Tekma made mention of the fact that so far we had done somewhat well in the short term in terms of the requirements we had to re uh, reach vis-a-vis -vis the IMF. But moving forward, the medium to long term is, is where uh, the devil is. And finally, on the point about Iran and Israel, right? The U.S., you would notice, has already tightened the screw. Its currency is on the ascendancy again, which is why our currency is depreciating. Now, if, if Israel and Iran goes the way that no one wants it to go to, there is a further escalation. The Israelis are saying they will also reply, uh, or there will be a reprisal for the Iranians. You're saying that we are going to suffer even more by, by way of the CD depreciating even further. Just clarify uh, those points for me a bit more. Uh, in terms of the global financial architecture, the dollar is one of the major reserve currencies. Uh, when there's risk in the financial system, people buy the dollar as, as a hedge against instability in the financial system. And when a lot of people are buying the dollar, it means that the dollar is going to appreciate because of the high demand. It's like when people demand more tomatoes, tomato prices will go up. So when we demand more of the dollar, that is going to increase the price of the dollar. And that means that our city is going to depreciate further. And that can cause significantly more problems for us. Mm. Dr. Thierry Champo, let me, let me come to you. On those same points, I don't know whether you have any reactions and what could be the consequences if, if this were to happen and the CD depreciated further. Because look, we even pegging it at the dollar, we hit 16 plus and then it started coming down came down to about 11, some, in some cases 10, and now it's hovering close to 14. Again, what could be the consequences of saying? Yeah, claim is absolutely right, right, on that, on that point, that the major headwind that we've got to deal with now is what happens on the external front. No two ways about that. Um, and if you see what happened in the last couple of days um, and again you could go back to October 7th with the Hamas issue um, if we see another reaction from Israel um, and that escalates more into a regional war right a regional conflict then what you end up actually doing is oil prices will actually spike up through the roof and this morning I've seen some analysts actually calling as much as 100 to 120 dollars a barrel, right? What that does really is to hammer an economy such as you know Ghana. So yes, we will benefit in terms of our oil exports, but particularly given that what we actually get, yeah, ourselves is less than what we are spending um, to import finished products and all of that. It's going to have a ripple effect on inflation, on cost of living 
And then a lot of the criteria that we even set, even on growth, right, GDP growth, a lot of the criteria that we've set in the IMF program would not be would not be met. And and that's a major, major concern that I'm sure a lot of the managers of the of the economy are having to uh, to, to to deal with um, in terms of what happens um, in the Middle East and the, the geopolitics, you know, uh, around around that. I think there are three other things, some of which um, Seth talks about the need or the urgency to get the debt treatment right going. So we signed the MOU in January, all well and good, but um, we have not done the individual country or bilateral signings on the uh, bilateral component of the debt. That's one. The more important one also is the actual external commercial debt restructuring, the $13 billion. If you do recall, the government said that by the end of March this year, they would have made progress on that. We are actually, today is the 15th of April, and not much progress has been made on that front. And I suspect we may not be able to conclude on that probably until about latter part of this year, August or September, you know, uh, thereabouts. Um, and then related to that is what happens with the arrears uh, that we have been accruing. Because um, yes, you do the debt calculations, you still have arrears that are not being fully uh, reflected in some of the debt numbers. And then the last point, which I would kind of mention as also another factor to watch, is what happens in the financial sector, the banking sector, right? We've seen some of the banks and the non uh, MPLs, the, the, the non performing loan ratios, begin to creep up uh, again, despite you know, the government um, intent of setting up that 1 billion financial sector stability fund. Um, we want to see more details in terms of its rollout and what that would do to help mitigate, right, some of the pressures that the banks are, are facing. So these are like four big things that we've got to contend with over the next, you know, six months to, to one year. What happens on the external front? Uh, what happens with the MOU or the debt treatment, uh, the commercial debt restructuring, particularly the $13 billion of euro bonds, um, the financial sector, and then we'll talk about the SOEs, which is a big, you know, sticky point, particularly in the energy space. Right. Uh, do hold for me. And, and Sir Takbe, I'm coming to you on some of those points. But first, I mean, I'll definitely come to you on the external uh, front, what we're doing in terms of debt treatment and the missed deadlines, among others. But first, I'd like to run by you this post by Joe Jackson, which I spotted yesterday, of Dalex Finance. And he says, IMF reaches staff level agreement on second review of Ghana's ECF. This, by the way, was on X. And he said, this should bring some relief to the city, which has suffered significant depreciation of about 8.5% in the first three months of the year. Uh, do you feel that this will bring the sort of relief that Joe Jackson is expectant it will. I just want your brief take on that before we go to the other substantive issues. Um, yes, on that point, we have um, we have had six uh, six hundred million US dollars injected into the economy by the IMF. We have had the World Bank and African Development Bank injecting some budget support. And by the way, um, we have had to use you know part of the IMF money for budgetary needs and not in support of you know, BOG's uh, balance of payment, which is what we normally do with IMF money. Uh, so the question is, um, what impact will 300 million, you know, have? Uh, I'm afraid um, it is, it's not going to be that significant because um, one of the points we need to note is that the cocoa sector is not bringing in, or it's not likely to bring in as much reserves despite the high cocoa price. And then in relation to the global, in the global context, just one point on that. As the dollar strengthens, gold weakens. And that also, you know, affects us. And then uh, the point about petroleum has already been made, particularly on the domestic sector and its impact on growth, the energy sector's impact on growth. You know, so I would, I would that's why I like to draw attention to the medium term. We need to have our own permanent sources of you know, generating more foreign forex. And this is one area in which 
for the non-traditional sector of the economy, uh, we the then Mama administration introduced the Ezim Bank, which was to act like the cocoa board for the non-traditional sector. But so far has been focused, you know, on domestic, more on domestic. Uh, so that's the point I, I can make, you know, on, on, your, on your question. All right. Um, the the million tier for me is very important. Right. Uh, but let's talk about the external debt framework. At a point in time, we were told about China, uh, that big elephant in the room, and, and some agreements in uh, the pipeline. But when you look at our debt restructuring from that point, that is where uh, the devil uh, seems to be. We've missed our deadlines, and now, as we know, the IMF is not giving us any more money until we receive assurances from uh, bondholders uh, in, in respect of you know, some of these debts that we have to rein in. How difficult will it be to reach these agreements with bondholders, both locally, because there have been other attempts, and externally, uh, in terms of our debt? Uh, how difficult has it been? Um, and then we come to how difficult will it be? Remember that even going to the board was delayed for a while until the chairman for the bilateral group, which is uh, France and China, provided a special waiver. And that's the only way in which we went to the board. The first review was also held in abeyance uh, because we had not concluded at the time the MOU for the, MOU for the bilateral loans. Uh, again, uh, that was agreed in principle, and the details were to be worked out. So we have now, in the release, you know, the staff level agreement is conditional, you know, because we are often elated by the fact that we have free staff level agreement and don't look at the conditions, which is what happened and the disappointment with many Ghanaians when the fund program itself, you know, was agreed. And we kept saying that there are conditions for going to the board. Here again, we have the same MOU uh, issue. We stalled the first, you know, uh, the, the first review hanging over us. Uh, we are now to finalize that with the bilateral, the official, you know, creditors. And let me explain. We have the domestic debt you know, restructuring, which we did, you know, with pensioners and the rest, you know, that to simplify it a bit for people to put it in context. And then the other category of debt, you know, as a result of our default, which we have to restructure, is what we are talking about now. Loans that were given to us by governments, that's why we call it official, you know, or bilateral, is between Ghana and those governments. And this is where China and France come in on behalf, you know, of those creditors. And because the fund itself, as a multilateral agency, the loan to the multilaterals, the IMF, the World Bank, African Development Bank, you know, were not touched, you know, and so we continue to benefit from them. But the IMF itself will not lend to a country that is bankrupt. That is one of the issues that we are dealing with, you know, with this debt crisis. And so until we get over that hump, which had been suspended, you know, or waived twice in going to the board, to the board, uh, then we are stuck. And that is why there is an agency. The Minister for Finance has assured, you know, that, you know, that agreement will be reached so that we can uh, go to the board. In any event, because of the April spring meetings, usually the IMF board does not meet during uh, its spring meetings in April and its annual meetings in October because it is preoccupied with reporting to the world, you know, and its members, members including Ghana. So it's in itself, even if we reach those agreements, it is likely that unless there's a special sitting for Ghana, uh, the board will meet only, you know, in May, you know, which is, is closed by the most optimistic. The third category of the loan that we are battling with is the commercial, that is, the one which involves the sovereign bonds that we have, that we issued and borrowing from banks, the private sector. And that is what, you know, uh, Prof mentioned, you know, uh, both of them mentioned, the two Profs have mentioned, you know, could drag, 
you know, uh, because we were told that we would be reaching some agreement with them, but it looks like uh, the negotiations are not going as well. And there are issues that are tied between that and, you know, what uh, we, are, we were talking about earlier, which is the bilateral, because the concessions that we get in the bilateral is likely to influence, you know, those negotiations as well. So, uh, in short, uh, yes, we have defaulted. Um, we are unable to service our debt. Uh, the suspensions are only suspensions. Uh, we are not getting any for get debt forgiveness because we are a middle income country and we may not. And so we see ourselves, you know, tied our performance in even getting funds under the IMF program, the World Bank and others, right. uh, being tied to these conditions. Right. Uh, Mr. Tekma, just hold for me. I'll be right back to you, gentlemen, to elaborate further on uh, some of these points. We'll take a brief a breather. We'll be right back on these e economy-related issues, the IMF program, the $360 million, and what we can expect moving forward. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back after the break. I'd also like to welcome back Seth Tekbe, Dr. Theo Champong, and uh, Professor Agloya. So, Mr. Tekbe, I was, I was with you uh, when you were making that point. Um, just to cap it all off uh, on our debt restructuring. So it's going to be murkier than we see it. While the finance minister is saying that they are going to rein in spending and all of that, uh, your projections then are what exactly in terms of the rest of our debt that we need to get restructured, without which not, we will not get further funding from the IMF. Your take is what exactly? And then we, we proceed from there. Can you hear me, Mr. Tekwe? Please, please unmute. Please unmute for me. Apologies. Uh, my, my, my simple take is that uh, we should work as expeditiously as possible on this matter because right. we have the experience of other countries, like Zambia and the rest, which, have, which took you know, nearly two years for them to resolve, you know, the, the, the issue that we are discussing. Because negotiations with creditors is not, you know, uh, that easy. Even when we did a 2015 bond, if you remember, the entire bond was used to refinance, you know, our short-term doom so uh, single spine and uh, then looming 200 million of the then looming uh, first sovereign bond you know, which was waiting for us. We used, we had used or uh, reserved 550 million, you know, of our own oil, you know, revenue to take it off. But we had a 200 million, which was added. And this involved in the World Bank. The World Bank, which is very sympathetic to developing countries. That discussion itself took quite a bit. So we have our own experience, and we have the experience of other countries to show that debt restructuring is not as optimistic as we were made to believe. And uh, that is what we are facing. But I still believe that, you know, within the Ministry of Finance, Bank of Ghana and others, there are staff, you know, who would complement the effort, you know, of the minister who have experience. That's the point. Often when we are discussing these issues, we don't mention the public officers because of the, what we know about the public, you know, sector, which is often not so, you know, palatable. But also, we have external advisors who are helping. Some of them have assisted us in the past, you know, pro bono, even though we've never acknowledged it in, in, in public. I think it's about time to, to say that within Ghana, you have, you know, uh, Barclays, Sanchez, Stambik, and others who often have reached out to their experts in London and elsewhere, Dubai, to assist us in our debt negotiations. And I believe that is still ongoing. So for that perspective, uh, we will. But the issue of debt, let us remember, and uh, that would be my, my point on this. Again, I go back to the medium term. Let us remember that our debt will dip slightly because it is suspended. And because we are not on, we do not account for all our liabilities, not just our rest of supplies and the rest. It will look as if the debt has gone down. But as the IMF projection mentions, which I mentioned at the beginning, you know, of my, of my submissions, the medium term will show that it will go up again. 
because if it is suspended, um, by the time the suspension ends in 2026, 2027, there about, it will come back to add to the debt. And that is where I believe even when the uh, uh, managing director of the IMF came together, this was discussed. And the disclosure was that we could still be in the upper 80s or early, uh, lower 90s, 90% 90 of GDP, which would not be good for us, you know, in our effort to secure long-term financing. That is another important point, Nakapu, the fact that we are relying on short-term debt, a three-month instrument, the treasury bill to finance our budget. Every three months, what it means in principle is that we should pay what we borrowed in three months. We are not paying. We are taking more money, you know, to pay off what should be, that is replacing debt with debt. Refinancing is okay, but we are not reducing the debt. And so the debt dimension, this is another dimension of the debt, which is that our reliance on a three-month instrument. Like if you took it that we started relying on the treasury bill, which is a three-month instrument, a 90-day, 91-day instrument mm. uh, from last year, this last year, we would have had three quarters already, you know, by June, you know, where we have borrowed, and instead of paying, we are adding. The interest rate is high, and often we use that debt which we borrowed at a high interest rate to repay debt which we borrowed at a lower interest rate, which should be the reverse, you know, the restructuring. So this is this is another dimension right. of the debt situation, you know, which I want to point out. And, and thank you for adding that dimension, that layer to the conversation. Let me bring in Professor Agloyo. Um, on two points, uh, Setekwa says the debt restructuring is not as optimistic as we've been made to believe, which also begs the question about the IMF, the Bretton Woods institutions, and whether sometimes, Seth said, they, uh, they tend to be sympathetic towards developing countries. But does that sympathy often also re result in misplaced optimism, where they are saying things that are not necessarily the true picture on the ground? How do you address these two concerns, uh, Prof? Okay, thank you very much. So I'll just make a few comments and then I'll come to your question. So sure. I agree with Jim Jackson that all else equal, the $360 million should reduce pressure on, on the city. But in the real world, everything is not equal. So we have headwinds in the Middle East. Uh, the size of the $360 million itself is not very huge, given, for example, the demand of dollars in the economy, etc. So that would be my first reaction. In terms of the medium term, uh, I agree with Seth, we need to be more measured. For me, critically, we need to improve our level of external reserves. Okay, currently, it stands about 1.7 months of import cover. For me, that is dangerously low. Okay, uh, even for individuals, the usual recommendation is that you have at least income covering six months of your living expenses. So for me, our import cover level should be a minimum of six to 12 months import cover. If you ask me, it should be even minimum of 12 months import cover. That allows you to withstand global economic shocks. If you look at what happened during COVID-19, et cetera, countries with high levels of external reserves did not suffer as much as we did. So for me, in terms of shockproofing the economy going forward, we should probably consider very seriously improving uh, foreign exchange reserves. We probably should put in place a policy as to the minimum level of external reserves that we want to have as a country. Then in terms of the debt treatment, uh, one of the things that I will be looking out for is equity, okay, between domestic and foreign creditors. Uh, domestic creditors took a huge hit, in many cases losing about almost 80% of uh, their investment. Okay, I think that even though we have foreign creditors who have more bargaining power, et cetera, we need to bargain harder and ensure that at the end of the debt treatment, our domestic investors don't come out worse compared to, to foreign investors. And then also going forward, uh, I think we need to examine very seriously what, what I'll call a capital structure decision, okay? What should be the optimal level of external debt that we hold as a country? Mm. 
when we borrow externally, yes, it helps. But then we are permitting what we call the original thing. <laughs> we are borrowing in a currency that we do not control. We cannot print. And that can put us in, <laughs> in trouble when we are in a financial crisis. Mm. So what percentage should we aim for in terms of the level of foreign debt compared to domestic debt? That should be a, a serious decision we should consider. What, what do you think? What do you think? External debt vis-a-vis -vis, um, local debt. W what should we be inching towards? If, if you were in the setup, if you were giving advice, what would you proffer mm -hmm. briefly on that? Well, I haven't. So usually I, I like to make recommendations based on uh, empirical work. I haven't done any empirical work to determine an optimal ratio. But if you ask me to recommend something, I'll say 20 to 30 stroke 70 to 80. Maybe let me be clearer. So maybe 20% foreign, 80% domestic, or 30% foreign, 70% domestic. I think that is a more sustainable long-term uh, ratio to, to have as a country. All right. And then to your question, yes, the IMF, World Bank, that's their work. They're supposed to help us when we are in trouble. That's what they were set up for. So yes, they tend to be super protected towards developing countries. That sometimes can lead to to over optimism but i think that that is what they are there for to support us and to help us manage for example a balance of exchange crisis yes but they should also be able to look us in the face and tell us when things are going wrong rather than wait till we're down in the valley and then they start i mean do, do you get the picture oftentimes they are accused of commending us touting us until disaster strikes when they know from our books that things are not going well uh, so that's why I was asking briefly about misplaced optimism. I remember speaking to the IMF boss uh, over a year and a half ago, and that optimism okay. did not resonate with Ghanaians when she said that, oh, Ghana is suffering from exogenous shocks, COVID-19, the Russo-Ukrainian war. We're still here. Look at where we are. So I don't know. Um, brief take on that, and then I'll focus on Dr. Thierry Champo. Sure. So I think it's, it's a balancing act, okay? Uh, the IMF is trying to reform its image. They've had a very treacherous past with African countries. <laughs> uh, from the economic adjustment programs in the 1980s, okay, structural adjustment programs in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of countries didn't want to even work with the IMF. So they are trying to reform their image to look more friendly to uh, developing countries. So you can see it for me from that point of view. But they do need to look us in the face when things are not going well and tell us that you need to do A, B, C, D. Other than that, our support will be limited. So I think it's a fine balancing act that they will need to achieve going forward. All right. Uh, Dr. Thierry Champong, now talking about their support being limited, the ground rules are clear. If you don't deal with the bondholders um, and get the assurances from them, there's no moving forward with getting more money from the IMF. Now, that is like getting cut at the knees, especially considering where we are. What does that mean? It, what, what does that picture really mean in terms of our economy and things getting better? Very simple. It says that if you don't get the signing of the agreement, whatever you have reached with them earlier this year, the MOU, each and every one of those official creditors needs to sign on a paper that says, okay, we agreed with the broad terms and this is what we're gonna to give to you. We've not been able to do that uh, in the level that is required. And until that is done, the release or the completion of the third review uh, would be pending. And so the $300 million or 360 that you're expecting is not going to come. That's that is as clear as that. Right. Mm. And remember, we had a similar thing in um, last year. So originally, the second review was meant to have been completed in November of last year. And the condition was that at that point, you needed the MOU agreed. And there was the back and forth. And it had to take us until January, middle of January of this year, before that came through. Now they're saying that you've got the MOU. But you still need the individual bilateral credit test to sign and say we agree to the terms of that MOU before we release that money. So if that delays, then basically the May deadline that you're looking at to get the $360 million coming in is not going to come in. Then further down the line, post May, you also got the big issue 
with your um, commercial uh, debt, that $13 billion of the euro bonds that you've got to restructure. And this is where I like to cut the IMF and the World Bank a bit of slack. I think you used the word misplaced optimism. I think it's rather for me more on the side of the government because we've always been very quick to... So, so the misplaced optimism is more on the side of government, not, not the IMF? On this, particular, on this particular issue of the debt restructuring, because mm. it's the government that has you know, gone to the market to say, ah, we're going to get this thing done by this date, including for the um, external commercial. They said that by the end of March, and this is in, you can go check the budget statement and check other statements. It was quite clear. So when you communicate that and you're not able to deliver by those deadlines, and it's not just this example, there are numerous other examples that I can cite, right? Then you begin to signal to the market, right? A certain element of uncertainty. And, and this is where like Seth and others have been saying, we need to exercise some level of, um, of restraint, particularly in terms of how over optimistic often we are to announce certain things to the market. Because we've seen what's happened with, with Zambia, right? Back and forth, uh, renegotiation. And even when they even got a deal with the uh, um, commercial creditors, the official ones came and said, no, 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 we don't agree to that. You're giving them too much of a haircut. Um, and so we need to rework the numbers to meet the debt comparability rules or debt treatment rules, right? So that the private creditors are not, the public creditors are not subsidizing the private ones. These are very complex, complicated things that we're, we're talking about here. So okay. I think it's really on the part of the government to be a bit more measured in terms of what they communicate to the market, particularly, you know, timelines that are not within their, um, their, 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 their control, control, right, right. Two, uh, quick, two quick, other quick things. So, so quick even, things. even as you give us those two other quick things, um, I would like to add this just because you've ended on that point. How difficult then do you think these attempts to reach an agreement with these bondholders will be? How difficult is it going to be? And that's a final question I'll throw to all three of you gentlemen, and then you can add your final comments and then uh, wrap the conversation. So I'm starting with you, Dr. Theo Champo. How difficult or easy will it be to reach these agreements with the bondholders? It's going to be difficult. Everybody is fighting their turf. Everybody wants to keep their corner. If you are the one that gave me money, right, uh, as government of Ghana, you have fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. You're not just writing off loans for the beauty of it. So you want to ensure that uh, two things, you are covering your back, and whatever you give as um, relief to me in terms of haircuts uh, in MPV terms or on the face value terms, other um, lenders would also be given the same thing so that everybody, there's equity in the treatment of the debt, like Ellie Klim um, was saying. So I think you probably are looking to <clears throat> about August or September before we get some sort of closure on that uh, external um, commercial debt restructuring. August like or the September. Zambia example, mm. Yes, and like the Zambia example, you're going to maybe have uh, two flavors. Uh, one where the debt repayment will be much bigger should the economy perform more. And then the other one, which will be like a baseline. Um, and we don't have time to get into the details. But I think two other really quick things to, to mention is on the reserve stand, um, position that, um, again, Alephlin talked about. It's important to remember that two, a year and a half ago, almost a year ago, we we're down to two weeks of import cover of reserves. And now we've come up to a little over one and a half um, months uh, or, or so. We should be around three months in, in terms of the safety. But, but, but if, if think, memory serves, um, recently we were around three months and it dipped, it dipped at a point well, again. Months, it dipped. Then we came all the way down to two weeks yeah. of import cover. Literally, we're almost broke. In, in very simple terms, yeah. Right. Um, right. But this going forward, this is why I think some of the good purchase program or the other asset purchase program of the central bank becomes extremely important. Are you referencing gold of, for oil? 
Is that what you're Let's referencing? Go for, uh, the, the gold foil is different. There's oh, you're referencing the other one? Okay, right. right. Purchase program that a central bank is doing. Um, that would help in terms of having alternative, you know, uh, currencies uh, uh, as a store or measure to build to bolster the reserve. The last point I want to mention is an important point that the IMF mentioned during Saturday's meeting: the recapitalization of the central bank. Right. So we know that. Uh, close to 60 or so billion was spent to support the government, print money and all of that. And there has to be an MOU signed to the effect that will allow the Treasury to pay back the central bank some amount in order to rebuild their, their, their balances. That's also something we need to uh, look out for. Thank you uh, for those points. Would you, have you concluded, I mean, with your... All right, I think this is what I'm going to do. I'll come back to you for about another 30 seconds, and that's it. Uh, Seth Tekbe, on, on that same point, how difficult or easy is it going to be negotiating, finding our way through this maze as far as the bondholders are concerned? Um, as, as I stated, we should, we, you know, how difficult, how easy, we should look at the experience of other countries. You know, uh, we are not unique uh, when it comes to these things, and therefore, for as long as countries have been negotiating for a very long time, there were countries that were negotiating during the death suspension COVID. And it took a long while. A few of them have still not you know, completed. That's how long it can take. Why? That's because, remember, when a foreign government gives you loan, it is from its taxpayers. And just as when we take loans, we say that we need the discipline of our representatives and we go to parliament, part of what is happening is that they have to go back to parliament on the new terms and conditions. If it was Ghana that was doing it, we would have been varying the terms and conditions of the loan under, you know, with a haircut, you know, with a extension, suspension and all that, you know, under the constitution. And we would have been compared to go back to Parliament and Article 1815. If I may draw that analogy to understand why sometimes you have these delays. For the commercial loans in terms of, you know, uh, they are market people. There are people who trade in loans. They, that's what it means, you know, and their performance depends on the interest that they earn. If you go and you are asking for a waiver on that, it is affecting their bottom line, as they say, and they are reflecting on the market. We look back and therefore they will negotiate real hard, you know, to make sure that, you know, they are not giving away. So these things are not, yeah, these are the, some of the reasons why these negotiations, you know, take a long time. But uh, a couple, let me just mention that we have been emphasizing debt, you know, and that is really so. But where does debt come from? Debt comes from borrowing. And where does borrowing come from? Borrowing comes from the deficit, the difference between your revenue and expenditure. You know, and therefore, we do not have time to go into that. But we must take, you know, the reforms in strengthening our revenue handles seriously. The number of taxes are just too many. You know, we know already, and that has been discussed. So until we are able to reduce our deficit, if you look at the IMF program, it talks about ITAS. What is ITAS? ITAS is the domestic, you know, sorry, the automation or digitalization, if I may use that word, of the domestic tax regime, which was to complement, you know, single window, if you remember, uh, West Blue, or now ICOMS. Right. For seven years, it wasn't that. Now it has become a conditionality. This was going to be phase two of the ICOM, so that you can interface the domestic tax system, you know, with the uh, with the center, and then make it, you know, more, you know, uh, more efficient. Expenditure. We have not mentioned expenditure. Expenditure rationalization, reduction. Sometimes there has never been an IMF program among the seventeen that we have not tackled expenditure. Here we are keeping expenditure. You know, where the minister has said that they will hold the line. Hold the line on what? Hold the line on an expenditure level that is already high, you know. Uh, and this may be the only IMF program where expenditure has not been taken quite seriously. As a result of... And, and who is to blame for that? Who is to blame for that? For the we, IMF or, or our own, you know, no, end of things? we have to blame ourselves. Because what are we talking about? We're talking basically about gift miss, which today is, is there, accounts payable. There was an initiative... You know, you can go back to PoofMap if you want to, you know, not to be partisan about this issue. You know, PoofMap from the Rollins era, you know, to 
the Kufu era, and then to Mills, Muhammad, the, and then we adopted the expression gift mix. That's what it is, to improve our expenditure management. Today, again, after seven years, it is another conditionality which we must meet. Right. Why couldn't we do these things for ourselves? Right. So my, my final point is, you can't keep borrowing and expect people to forgive, he pick, to suspend. You must learn to repay. And that is a why under the homegrown we brought a sinking fund. Right? Again, it is as decimated as a stabilization fund. Today we have we would have gone into the stabilization fund to stabilize or to hold the budget deficit, which is the one that causes borrowing and debt. Right. You know, on account of the global crisis that we are talking about. You see, we are facing another global crisis. And I've been saying that you will not run an economy continuously for three years without one crisis or the, or the rest, the flooding right. and all those things. And that is why you need that stabilization fund when the times are good, okay. when you have three oil fields, so that you can use to stabilize. So in short, we need our own short-term measures, but we need to deepen our structural you know, measures such as the what. Uh, eloquent Prof mentioned, you know, the balance between the domestic and the seller. That was the essence of putting the government bonds on the stock exchange so that it becomes marketable. You know, yes, we were balancing it. It was very new, but it became the largest fixed income market on the stock exchange. What have we done with it? We mm. stopped the payments. You know, we ran it down. And those who would patronize that domestic market Pension funds and the rest. Today they've been hurt. Households. Right. How do you, you require another rebuilding of confidence? You know, that was the essence of putting the government bonds on the market so that we can grow the domestic debt market. You know, that's the simple explanation right. for that exercise, right. which itself has been mm. uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Thekpe. Let me, let me bring in uh, Professor Agloyal. You, you have the final word on, on this, and then if there's Anything little to add, we can add that. If not, we can draw the curtains of the conversation. Prof. Sure. So, well, I, I do agree perfectly with Seth that we need to learn from the experience of other countries so that we don't make similar mistakes. Uh, for me, I think that I, there's some level of agreement between creditors, us and the creditors, and that shouldn't make it too difficult to uh, finalize an agreement. Okay. All right. Brief words. Yes. Uh, thank you very Especially much, gentlemen. Just a few. A few okay, more. go ahead. Especially, we need to consider equity again between official creditors and commercial creditors, and domestic creditors, and all. We'll try. We'll try and wait for Prof. I mean, he's he's waited patiently to for the others to speak. We'll just try uh, one more time. Hopefully, the internet connection helps. Prof, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Um, creditors. But for me, critically going forward, we need forward for me, we need to build our reserves. Let's like my connection. Hello. Yes, uh, Prof, we missed what you were saying. Just go back by about 30, 40 seconds. D just share your thoughts okay. with us again. Yeah. Sure. So there, there needs to be equity between domestic and foreign creditors, uh, uh, official and commercial creditors as well. But for me, going forward, we need to build our exchange rate reserves tackle corruption because we lose a lot of money to corruption and then also reform our institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for joining the conversation. We had uh, Seth Tekpe, former Minister of Finance. Uh, we also had Dr. Theo Champong, a political risk analyst, and Professor Eli Plim, uh, Komla Agbloya, Professor of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School. Gentlemen, we're very grateful that you took the time to join us this morning on uh, this conversation on the AM show. You are welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank uh, you. So moving on from here, we're going to be contemplating genetically you know, modified organisms, GMOs as we call them, and what the Peasant Farmers Association is saying on the back of uh, that. They're up in arms. They feel this is a threat, and they're unhappy with the promotion of same. We'll be bringing you that discussion up next on the AM Show. Do stay.
Welcome back on the AM show. We're going to be talking about genetically modified organisms. Uh, but before we get there, let's tell you a bit about the Royal Cozy Hotels. Escape to Drapa, Dubai. Now you've seen the rest. Now is the time to see the best. Take a break from work. I need to take a break, right? And take a break from the south. The Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, that is Drapa, Dubai, is the place to relax, rewind, and re-energize. It is away from the stress of the south. Now, this is what awaits you, an unforgettable safari experience, amazing array of wildlife, including lions, hippopotamuses, zebras, ostriches, among many others, using our spacious and well-secured game tour vehicles or using quad bikes. Now, two, you can contemplate water sports such as jet skiing, boats or canoe rides, and uh, you can top up that with various family games to keep you and your families excited every day. It's a great tourist attraction. It will take you to the great tourist attractions in the Upper West Region, including the Mushroom Rock, Slave Caves, among others. So, escape from the south. Escape all the way to the north. Escape to the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel at Drapa, Dubai, for an unforgettable safari experience. Just call these numbers, 050-169-4280 or 248 463 for reservations or further inquiries now. Pick up your phone, give them a call. But here in the studio, Sweetie Abochi is on hand with me Back. as we get into the conversation on genetically modified organisms. Uh, would you like to tell us about what we expect on this conversation and who's joining us? Well, I'm sure you've already seen our guest in the middle is sandwiching <laughs> Bismarck Tete, who is the executive director of the um, Peasants Farmers Association. We have other guests who will be joining us later, so we introduce them as and when they join us. Um, well, we have um, Samuel Edward Krawe, who is the General Secretary of Agricultural Workers Union, also joining us on Zoom for the conversation. Now, these um, Peasants Farmers Association have some grievances. They're saying that if we allow genetically modified organi organisms, that is crops among others, into the country, there are some risks that we might face, both sanctions on international exports and all that. But they are here in the studio with us. The executive director is here in the studio with us. So we might as well hear from the horse's own mouth. Exactly what is your grievances? What is your issue about genetically modified organizations? On the back that this bill that was recently passed in March has been in existence since 2011. And we know that um, by 2050, some research that I was uh, reading up on says that we, we would have to, you know, cultivate more or fall on these genetically modified organizations to make up for the quantity of food that the world will need in order to feed everyone in this world. So what is your issue with genetically modified organizations? Right. Organisms. Organisms, right. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, yeah. for having me. And I will say good morning to all our listeners and our viewers. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you spoke about the act uh, that was passed. Yeah. Uh, that was the Biosafety Act. It was actually passed in 2011 mm. by the Parliament of Ghana and assented by the President. The other act that was passed to complement the Biosafety Act is the Plant Variety Protection Act mm. that was uh, passed in 2022. So these two acts combined, they give powers and authority to the Biosafety to approve the commercialization of GMOs in Ghana. Now, uh, the Peasant Farm Association of Ghana, together with other stakeholders, mm. a host of them, mm. and very key individuals, are really against the introduction of GMOs into the country. And our reasons are quite simple. In the first place, if you listen to the proponents of GM technology, you are told that when the GM comes, it's going to alleviate the issues of the smallholder farmer, it's going to make them more productive, it's going to increase their productivity, and it's going to increase their incomes. Now, when you come to a country like Ghana, and if you look at all our agricultural challenges, they are very much well documented, and we all know what the farmer needs for him or her to be productive. In the first place as a country, we still rely heavily on rain for our production. So when the rains, the rains are good, we produce well. 
where the rains don't come well, they are in trouble. We have a potential to increase our irrigation across the country, but we are doing just less than 10% of our potential as for irrigation. When it comes to our equipment that farmers need, combined harvesters, tractors, uh, and other uh, mechanism equipment, we don't have them. When you come to areas around access to finance, our farmers are struggling to get loans with interest rates of more than 30%. And then even lastly, without GMOs, our farmers are able to produce to the extent that they are recording post-service losses. They are producing to, to the extent that now, if you go to northern Ghana, our farmers have done so much rice, but they have no market for the rice. And this is done without GMOs. So our first question is, how do we ignore all these challenges of our country and then claim that if you go for GMOs, you're going to solve the problem? So you're saying that they should first um, focus on these post-harvest losses and um, using other technology to augment farming processes rather than go for GMOs? Is that what your, your that's issue one, that's is? One of the, a couple of, that's one of them. One of them is that we have fundamental problems. Why don't we solve them whilst we are jumping onto the, the GMO boots? Our second point, if you look at the GM technology, it is not a technology that is homegrown. That is what? Homegrown. Right. It is not a Ghanaian technology. Right. It's a technology that is being led by powerful multinationals whose aim is to take control of the seed industry. And as a country, our question is, if for fertilizer, we rely on Europe to import fertilizer, now, we want to seed our ownership or control of our seed also into the hands of multinationals who control our seed. So that in the next five or ten years, if there's another episode of COVID or another Russia Ukraine crisis or even this Israel and Iran crisis escalates, then, and we are relying on the GM technology, which is not ours, it means that until they bring the technology, we cannot plant. And that is going against the principles of food sovereignty. And as a country, it is sad that we are not concentrating on building our own technology to ensure that we, the people, can rely on the seed that is being produced here domestically. Okay, a quick point on that. Though. What stops us from tapping into GMO, uh, the GMO tech space? Would you be better satisfied? I get the first point yes. that we've not even dealt with post-harvest yes. harvest losses yes. and all of that. That's, that's one point. Yes. But are you suggesting that if we got it right, if we had homegrown technology, yes. the CSIR yes. has been working on some of these better yes. crops, better yes. seedlings and yes. all of that. Are you suggesting if we got there, then it would make sense? You see, the recently developed national seed plan if you go through it, you see the varieties of seeds that our national institutes have developed. For maize alone, they've developed over 54 varieties of maize. Some of them are climate resilient, some of them are nutritious, some of them are re resistant to pests and diseases. 54. Out of that, it's only 20, about 20, that are being marketed. The rest, they're not able to market them. They're on the shelves. If you even take soya, they've done about 24. By the market, there are only five. So even our local capacity, we've not even exhausted it, let alone think of GMOs. We have the capacity, our scientists have the abilities to produce a lot of varieties of seeds. And they've done that. They are not able to market it because there are problems that are affecting production in Ghana. And we've not addressed it. So the challenge is how do you leave all what you've done and then you're going to bring a technology that is not even, it's not even yours? That's the bigger problem. You understand? And the third point is that if you read the narrative about GMO and experiences in other parts of the world, it's not really a, a very a pleasant or rosy experience. If you read the stories about what the Indian farmers went through with, regarding the BT uh, mustard, if you read what our neighboring people in Burkina Faso went through regarding the BT uh, cotton, Mm. Those are not good experiences that Ghana should be latching on and be ready to go for this game technology. Okay, so we'll come back to you on some of the dangers inherent in mm. using GMOs and whether there's any positive side to it, right. because so far <laughs> you've, you've stressed the negative. But let's also bring in Edward Carraway, General Secretary of the Agricultural Workers Union and uh, the PRO of the Agric uh, Ministry in the person of Tanko uh, Bagbara. Gentlemen, thank you for joining the conversation. Mr. Carraway, can you hear me? Tanko, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Uh, uh, let, let me just start with you, Tanko, even 
or maybe let me bring in Edward Karawe and then we'll come to you. Sweetie, we'll come to you on what your reaction is, initial reaction to some of these. Uh, Mr. Karawe, what is your take on these GMOs and the stance adopted by the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana? Bismarck here makes the point that, listen, it, we have post-harvest losses. So it's not as though we we're not producing enough. We are producing quite a bit, but a lot of it is lost to, you know, post-harvest losses. And then it, indigenous scientific work has been done. I cited the CSIR, and he mentioned maize, 54 varieties. We are using just about 20. He mentioned soya, over 20 varieties. We are using only five. We've not even exhausted local capacity, and we want to do what exactly? What's your take, Mr. Carraway? You would have to unmute, sir. Uh, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me say good morning to you and then uh, Bismarck and all those who are listening to us. I think the, the point is well uh, made. Um, if you look at development policy, it's meant to address issues in context. Otherwise, if you have a policy that does not address the specific issues around you, then that policy may be far-fetched. You, uh, Bismarck did indicate the fundamental things about agriculture. What are the challenges? And that has always been our position. That first, to be able to come up with solutions that are enduring, that are sustainable, you know, we need to examine what our problems are. And if you look at all our challenges, which all of us know and our viewers also know, so I don't need to belabor the point, from production to harvesting and then to marketing, we can find out that GMO is not a solution at all. It's not a solution. And you see, it's, it's just troubling that there are state institutions that are bent on bringing in this GMO. No matter no. all the reasonable arguments and uh, uh, suggestions we give to them. Why, the why, do, is, why do you think that is? I'll let you go on. But why do you think they are, they are trying willingly to, to bring it in? I'm, I'm thinking this way because in, as far back to 19, uh, 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 I mean 2018, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, invited us to a stakeholder meeting at the ministry there to speak to our diplomats about this emerging uh, thing of, uh, called GMO. In fact, all the proponents, including the National uh, Biosafety Authority, were represented. And those uh, professors uh, who uh, are advocating for the GMO were all present. We had two sessions at the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and we were also there. At the close of the day, they made a simple uh, test that all the diplomats who were sitting in the room, would they go for GMO based on the arguments both sides have made, or they will not go for? I'll tell you that I think the number was about uh, 40 something, uh, 40 something, uh, 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 the number. Only two said that they will go with GMO. But all the rest say no, they will not go with GMO. Look, the, the, the argument is simple. GMO is not part of our solution. In fact, if Galam say today is destroying all the farms, what can GMO do? When Galam say today is destroying the river uh, bodies and poisoning them and salting the rivers, how can GMO be a solution to that? How can GMO be a solution to when we uh, cut down all our forests and other farmlands? How can GMO be a solution to that? Hmm. But then, based on all these arguments, the ministry, we put pressure on the ministry to come out. And as far back as, uh, as 2019 or so, the, minister, the then Minister for Agriculture came out and made it categorical that Ghana will not go in for GMO, and that we have got enough uh, scientists and scientific work which can boost agricultural production without going into GMO. 
So I don't know where the National Biosafety uh, Authority and those who are researching into the GMO have the authority to continue to research into GMO and with whose funds? We should go and find out where they have got the funds to do that. Is it the state funds? Uh, the budget that uh, government has been struggling to give uh, to state institutions, is it that one that they use to do the research on the uh, GMO contrary to government's own policy? You know, that we are not ready for what? Uh, GMO. I just saw a news item, I hope it is true, from the current Minister of uh, 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 Agri, saying that they have not authorized commercialization of the 14 uh, bio, I mean, GMO seeds that they, they say they have come out with. Then who are they uh, working for? The mother ministry is saying that they are not ready, not today, even in the past and now. They say they are not ready and they are not ready for it. Why should our scientists, those who are behind it, and particularly the uh, uh, the NBA, National Biosafety Authority, continue to research into it and then want all of us to be excited about it when it is not a solution at all. Okay, Mr. Karawa, we have the PRO for the Ministry of Agri joining us, Mr. Egbagbara. He's on the phone with us now. I'm sure you've been following the conversations to this point. How does this sit with you? They've raised some concerns about, you know, moving away from sustenance farming, um, post harvest, post harvest, uh, you know, Post-harvest losses. Post-harvest right. losses, among others. And they're saying that GMOs are not the solution to the problems that exist, especially when it, in the agri sector. How do you respond to all these? And uh, a very good morning to my uncle, Uncle Kiroe, and uh, to other family. Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, it's been a story when this came up. So we, we know that how this country and uh, 2011 uh, they want uh, eight months this time and uh, therefore we thought that the minute a red plant you know we Mr. Carraway <laughs> Uh, uh, actually, Mr. Bagbara, but our sincere apologies. I, I'm sorry I have to uh, do this. Just hold for me. Hold for me briefly. Um, let, let's, let's also bring into the conversation Eric Amaning uh, Okoria. Uh, he joins the conversation. He deals in biotech, among others. So we, we get to know what exactly this implies for us. Mr. Okoria, uh, good, good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Hello, Mr. Okoria, can you hear me, sir? Mr. Okoria, by the way, is Executive Director, National Biosafety uh, Authority. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you very well. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you now. Um, quickly, so we'd just like to find out, and my colleague Sweetie Abuchi will come in shortly. Um, what is your reaction to all of this genetically modified organisms? The peasant farmers, the General Agricultural Workers Union, they are saying no, and there seems to be some push to guide this, looking at the global extent of it, why it is being supposedly foisted on us. From where you sit in biotech, what does this mean? And is it okay, the right so, way to go? Yeah, so uh, thank, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, let me first explain what the National Biosafety Authority did, which has part of these reactions from the from the parties you, you talked about, the peasant farmers and the others. Now, the Biosafety Authority uh, received application from Bayer, West and Central Africa, and uh, Syngenta, South Africa, to register some events that they have in Ghana to register. So when the application came, it did register. Into those economic participants have been brought up in some green tech or basically GM. So we took a piece on those uh, different kind of five crops. There were eight um, different days varieties and uh, six different days varieties. Mr. Okoria, uh, yes. we, we, we are having some slight challenges with hearing you. Uh, if you could reposition yourself. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm trying to do that. 
Uh, am I okay? I think it's better now. Yes, so um, we did risk assessment for those we received, and, and there was nothing wrong, and there was no difference between those electrical modified drops that, uh, or not drops, grain that uh, we were from, or they want to bring to Ghana, and what we have in Ghana again, except the other genes that they have. And we checked the databases to see if they have been in use anywhere. We found that uh, those genetically modified organisms have been used over 10 years in about 15 countries. They have been eaten, they have been processed into whatever for over 10 years in about 15 countries already. So we went ahead and registered them in Canada. So what actually the Biotech Authority has done is um, uh, registering the events in Ghana. What that means is that we have not brought those GMOs into Ghana yet, and we have registered them, we have certified that they are good, they can be used for food, they can be used for feed, they can be, be used for processing. The registration does not allow planting in Ghana because it, it, they did not apply for environmental relief. They just applied for food, feed, and for processing. Now, in case any Ghanaian individual or industry company wants to bring it in, the person has to get import permit before he can bring it in. So that is the situation. Now, asking whether they are good, as far as we sit as the regulatory institution, for food they are fine, they are the same as the conventional ones we have here. And, and so uh, we are fine, we certify that they are, they, they are safe. And uh, again, the question of do we need it, I would say that already we've been getting some calls from some individuals and companies wanting to bring such types of genetically modified uh, grain into Ghana to be processed into something else, animal feed and other... Are, are, these, are these individuals within Ghana or outside of Ghana? Pardon me? Are these individuals within Ghana or outside within of Ghana? Within Ghana. Right within Ghana. They've been calling that it's so called we are not getting enough of these want to bring in GMO, GMO coffee to be processed. The awareness to be processed. And so um, already we've been getting that call. You see, in the and, 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 and do this for me, for the sake of analysis, about how many people are we looking at? Because if you have the number of farmers we do, millions, and you tell me maybe two people or five people or 10 people or even a thousand people. Um, so put it into context. Yeah, yeah uh, um, this is not a matter of farming. It's industry. They are not going to plant it. It's not for planting. So it's for people so it's who process. Going to farm the farm. It is not going to go into farm. It's for it's for it's for the industry. Mm. You see, so uh, it is not business with the farmers and the industry. I, I've talked about two different industries in Ghana, calling whether they can bring it in and the procedure through which they can bring. It. Two different I've industries. About three mm. different businessmen calling to find out whether they can bring this in for sale. So if it was for planting, that would have been for farmers. This is not, these are not for planting. They are ready to be processed into other products. So that is the situation. All right, hold, hold, hold for me. I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm just going to bring in, um, unless Sweetie Abochi, you have something. I'm going to bring in Bismarck and Edward because they are into this, you know. Uh, any question, maybe one, briefly. Uh, both of you, and then we'll, we'll throw that to Mr. Okoria for reactions. Right. <clears throat> Sorry. The, the, the response from the AMB is quite interesting. I wanted to find out from him. If you look at the acts that set up the National Basel Authority, they are supposed to have a board that approves all these processes. And then as part of the board, we know that there is a rep from the Ministry of Food and Agric, that's supposed to sit on the board. And the, so the Ministry are supposed to be aware of all these things that have gone on. So the question for him is, is the board aware? Is the Ministry aware 
And can he share with the general public the reports that indicates how they conducted the assessment for the general public? Because well, that's what the Act mandates them to do. All right, thank you. Uh, let me come to Edward. Yeah. Right Ed, Ed, no, hold for yeah, me. I just uh, want the two together, then you answer them. No, uh, let, me, let, let me respond to okay, this very go, quickly. Go ahead. It is simple. I, I, he said the issue of what? Food and agric. Uh -huh, very good. The board has, uh, the, the NBA is supposed to be headed by a board, and the board is the decision making body. It was the board that made decisions for this. And the board is represented by the Plant Protection and Regulatory Services Directorate. And the director now is Mr. Eric Quay, who was in the meeting when the board was debating. You see, before making decisions, the board debated. And Minister of Hybrid was there. Mr. Eric Quay, the director, was there. He contributed before the board made that decision. So yes, the board made the decision. And after making the decision, we wrote all the regulatory agencies. We went with food and drug authority, we went with custom, we went with GPRC, South Ghana Standard Authority, Environmental Protection Agency, we wrote to all of them that this is the decision. Now again, the law, to answer the question, the law says that upon request, Anybody who has any interest in getting the any document for sending the application should make it known to the authority and we will release it. So the law is upon request. So anybody, let me uh, uh, announce it. Anybody who has an interest in this matter, just contact us at the NBA and we will give you the decision document. We can give you the risk assessment document to look at it. And so uh, it is that transparent. It was the board that made the decision. Thank you. Are you, are you satisfied? So is it not curious that the MOFE statement says they don't know anything about it? The Minister of Food and Agriculture. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, which, uh, which is uh, what uh, Edward Carrier yes. was referencing yes. by so Brian. Is it not curious? How do you react to that, Mr. Carrier? Pardon me? So the statement from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, they claim no knowledge of this. Yes. No, no, no. That, is, if I, um, uh, uh, the, the, that, that statement was made by the PRO. The PRO should have contacted PPRSD or Ed. So when I saw that, I saw that discrepancy. So I called the chief director. I said, chief director, this is what is happening. And you were represented by the director of PPRSD. And so uh, your uh, position is at variance with the, that of the board on which you are represented. So the fault is coming from uh, um, inaccurate information from the Ministry of Agriculture. And that doesn't mean that the writing was not done. And I'm saying that uh, anybody interested can contact us, and we will give them all the documents. All right. Uh, before, before, before we do, Edward Carraway. Before I let him go, I wanted to, I'm curious. Some uh, of the Edward, Edward that... hasn't posed this question. Let's not forget oh, that. Okay, but right. let's bring in the PRO uh, of, of the Agri Ministry. Uh, Sweetie, I was just alerting you that yeah. Edward hasn't made his question, but yeah, we can bring in the to PRO bring him in, right? to react. Edward, go that. ahead. Okay, so let's let's do this. My my, que my question is, my, my question is, uh, Mr. Okori claims that uh, GMO poses no risk. I want to I ask said, him. No, I said is those he GMOs aware? that we have worked on do not pose. I did. I don't say GMOs pose no, poses a GMO no risk. The question we very and we ask. I think both of them are silent. Um, who's, asking, who's speaking? I'm asking them. So, Mr. Um, Karawai, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. Your connection is not so good. We'll come back to you. On the issue, what I was trying to intimate earlier, on the issue that uh, Mr. Okoria was speaking of, he made mention of the Agric Ministry. We have the PRO, Mr. Bagbara. Uh, can you clarify for us, Mr. Bagbara, what the situation is? Uh, per the statement versus what uh, Mr. Okoria is saying. What's your reaction? Yes, thank you once again. Uh, per our statement, we sought to uh, lay the fears of our farmers as there were a lot of agitation as far as this uh, product I concerned. We wanted to assure them that the ministry has not released any form of seed or planting materials. 
because normally we have a procedure through the plant protection and regulatory services directory. We have the National Varietal Release Council uh, Committee, which is under the National Seed Council. So normally we have a procedure and a process to validate and release new planting materials to farmers. They know the, the process. And uh, so it was surprising that there was an uprising against the ministry uh, that would endorse the use of these uh, products that have been released. So clearly we want to uh, tell our farmers that we will continue to monitor and ensure that uh, seed and planting material used are approved and have gone through the right procedure for farmers to use. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Can I come in here? Is this Mr. Okorie? Yeah, this is Mr. Okorie. But you see, I, I, I like um, what the PRO is saying. Now, what we need to understand from what he's saying is that he's talking about seeds and plants. For seeds and plants, the Varietal Release Committee must release them, I mean, approved before it comes out. That is the case of the BT cowpea for environmental release, meaning for planting, which we applied for. When we approved it, they, they went to the Barbarita Release Committee for their approval, and they are with them. They, they, they are working with them before farmers can plant. That is the kind of thing the PRO is talking now. You see, what we are talking about, about the 14 applications we released, are not for planting. They are not seeds. You, you understand? They are not seeds at all. They are for food, feed, and for uh, processing. They are very different. And so, one, yes, the, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture was involved and the decision was taken by the board according to the law. And they are for food and feed. And so, um, if anybody wants to come in, the person gets a uh, simple permit from us, and then the person gets the relevant permit from food and uh, uh, put the drugs authority, then you bring it in for the processing that they want. This is not seed. And so, uh, Ministry of Agriculture's uh, information is quite different from what we have. There is a kind of mis mis misunderstanding here. And uh, uh, what, what happens is that I wish the PRO had cited the, the press release that we came out there then he could have put the Ministry of Agriculture's position in, right, in the right context. So that, that is, we are talking about two different things. Food, feed, and for processing, and not for planting, does not go through the varietal release committee. So we are talking about different But Mr. Correa, before we bring in Edward yes. Curry, where before Sweetie brings him in, is it, is it not only a matter of time? If you bring it in for processing and all of that, it's only a matter of time, to be fair, following the examples of other countries. You bring it in, start from there, it's only a matter of time, and then it, that, it gets into, into other uh, spheres. Is that not the truth? No, no. Uh, uh, no, that uh, grains are different from seeds. Grains are different from seeds. I mean the approvals for GMOs. Eventually, once you start bringing them in for processing, you have one foot mm -hmm. through the door, and, and eventually it cascades into other aspects, doesn't it? Other aspects like what I don't get you, what kind of aspects are you talking about? What well, it can be aspects? used for food, not just processing, not just for other, but it will get into our food, it will get into processed uh, elements that are, you know, on of the course. market for consumption. Of course, the Bracken Biosafety Authority has uh, approved it for food, for feed, and for processing. These three. I see. Yes, for food, feed and process. And we did the risk assessment. They are good for food. We did risk assessment. They are good for feed. And they are good to be processed into whatever. So this trade, I don't know what access you have outside this trade. I, 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 I will advise that we take our time to read the documents around these uh, decisions by the board of the National Biosafety Authority and get the proper understanding. So let's Mr. Uh, Corey, just, just yes. to intervene, I didn't mention any category outside of the three. At a point, you mentioned yes. that yes. processing. So I kept focusing on feed and other things, not necessarily for human consumption. 
So it was from what you were saying. I never suggested that it was outside the three. But, sweetie, can we yeah. bring in uh, Edward Carrier? No, 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 I'm curious to know. There are some global restrictions on uh, genetically mod modified crops, for example. So if we are going to be using these to augment our farming processes and the rest, are we going to export them? The concern is that we might be losing some foreign uh, revenue. Would that be the case? Because we cannot export some of these um, products, produce. Mr. Corey. Hello. I'm saying that, did you hear my question? Uh, can you repeat, please? There are concerns that uh, we might lose some foreign revenue because there are some global restrictions on exporting genetically modified crops, for example. If this is the way to go, will we be, in fact, losing some foreign revenue because then we cannot export our produce? Ah, okay. I, I understand your question. So, um, um, what can we export from Ghana? The GMOs we can export from Ghana are the GMOs that have been planted in Ghana and they are meant for that purpose. Um, one, that is not what we are discussing here. And yes, it can happen. Ghana can export. That is when the farmers grow them in Ghana and they want to export. That after, for example, I'm using the, this example, after the salary has come out, or right, people have to do salary in typical fees, and farmers have planted and harvested that position that they want to export. What I know, I don't see a motion, I do see a program space. But what I know is that there is a huge market, just as far as it is, yes, it has reduced the growing of GMOs in those countries. But they import, Europe is importing GMOs for process. Europe is importing China, Port, and France, Argentina, Colombia, and 50 billion people of GMOs. Um, so if the Chinese government can plant GMOs, yeah. There is that market. Yeah, uh, and let's put on record that I am not speaking to my name. Sorry, I'm to speak like this. Uh, I'm, I'm a reporter, a promoter. But Mr. Corey, the, the positioning again, we can barely, for about 30 seconds, we've not, there's interference. I, I wish you could reposition again and just make that point, please. Uh, 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 do you hear me now? It's better. Can you just go back a bit and, and make your yes, point? Again? I said, I said, I am a GMO regulator. I'm not a GMO promoter. So the person is asking me to talk as if I'm a promoter. So um, I want to uh, uh, get this on record that I, in answering the question, as a regulator, if the GMO has been approved in Ghana by the National Biological Authority and farmers have planted, for example, the BTKP, which the Biological Release Committee is working on with Surrey, if it comes out and farmers land and farmers want to export so that they get their money, there's a huge market out there. But that was Brazil, your concern, Colombia, right? Uh, in your statements that you released, yeah. your concern was that you cannot export some of these produces yeah, so, because yeah. there are constraints on, on exporting them. Yeah, so let no, let me, sorry, let me, I was just bringing back um, let me, let me Mr. Tete yeah, into the conversation. The issues that he raised. You see, I think uh, Mr. Okore is doing uh, damage control. Because one, when the news of the approval of the commercialization came, it wasn't the National Bank Authority that released the first statement. It was actually a US journal that first released the statement that Ghana has approved GMOs. Mm. So why did the NBA release the first statement? They didn't do it. Then Daily Graphic took the story and also published it. They still didn't release it until we released the statement before they came out. So if they were clear about that, why did they start the release from day one? Okay, hold that Number two, me. Let, me, let me just add the right. Number two, he says that the, some companies are already calling out to him for them to approve the into to the mm. country. And there are two main crops, uh, maize and soya. It's either, and I'm surprised that he's saying that MOFA was part of the decision. Because if you look at the policy objective of MOFA, even under the new PFD 2.0, is to ensure that farmers increase their productivity and also export maize and soya. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the President's State of Nation address, 
He mentions that Ghana is now a net exporter of maize, mm -hmm. meaning we've produced so much maize that we are now exporting. But Mr. Cohen, you see my telling us that the maize we have is not enough, so they've given approval for us to import GM maize into the country. For which industry? Currently, farmers have produced maize, they are not getting markets. So is it saying that the companies that are, that are there, they do not know that there is maize available, but it's the GM maize that they want. Okay. I want to bring back Edward Carroll because it, it appears we've left you out for a while. You've been following. Any reactions so far? Well, um, I still want to put some questions before uh, Okori. Mm. To, and so, then so, also so, Mr. To... Carraway, the, the, the caveat was that it was one question. Bismarck did that initially. Yes, there was a follow-up, but just make it, uh, you know, limit okay. to one, maximum two, if you can. All right. Thank you. One, he's talking about uh, that some individuals and institutions are asking for GMO uh, products to be used in their processing. Processing what? And for whose consumption? Exactly. What is the difference between the seed, which now culminates into the, 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 the grain, and then the grain itself, which is a GMO, process for whose consumption? Are they going to process here and export it to outside countries, or they're going to export it and sell it to us to eat? You see, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to uh, also understand him saying that he's a, a regulator, but not a promoter. <laughs> if you regulate and pay your choices, you allow uh, GMO. You are promoting GMO. Exactly. You are promoting GMO. That's the logic. If you pay your regulation, if you say no GMO, then you are not promoting GMO. No, he cannot. At this point, try to take a, a cover, a safe cover to say that I am just a regulator, I am not a promoter. The work of a regulator is either to promote or constrain. That is the work of a, a regulator, unless he has a superior uh, uh, explanation to that. Otherwise, this is our understanding. So you can't run away from the fact that pay your job and pay what you are doing, pay what you have done so far, you are promoting GMO. Mr. Karewe, uh, no, Mr. Yes. Korye, if you're still with us, just your final thoughts and uh, reaction or response to that, and then we can wrap it up. Yeah, uh, 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 do you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, very good. So I, I want to comment on what uh, the gentleman just said. The, re the, the regulator has two uh, reactions, yes and no. We say no where we find something wrong during our risk assessment and then we stop that GMO from coming in. We say uh, that does not make us uh, anti-GMO. That does not make us anti It makes us a regulator. We say yes. When we have done our risk assessment, risk evaluation, and the product is safe, that does not make us a promoter. And so a regulator is a regulator, and we have two responses, yes and no. So when, if at this time we have said yes, it doesn't make us promoters, we still remain regulated. A time will come when an application comes in, and we, we may say, no, that doesn't make us anti. So a regulator is a regulator. That's our job. Right. And two, if you, if you. we Let's are not doing damage control. Back. We are not doing damage control. We sent out information first. Uh, USDA, uh, the publication by USDA was done by Mr. Joshua Taylor. Mr. Joshua got the information after we sent the information out. And before Joshua published, it, Joshua called me personally to verify the information. And so he got it from what we have done and sent out. And so this is not damage control. And they got it from the USDA. And so it doesn't mean that the USDA was the first institution to bring it out. No. They got it from us, from somewhere, and they called me that this is what we have said. Is it true? I said yes. And then he published it. So Joshua can be contacted to ascertain what I'm saying. So it is not damage control at all. Our point is that we take a time 
to study the situation, study the law, read widely so that we understand how the GMOs are handled and managed. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eric Ameningo Kori, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Bio Biosafety Authority. Um, you were saying something, you know, you can wrap it up in about 30 seconds for us. Yeah, you know, he mentioned that they are not promotive. In their own statements, if you look at the last paragraph, titled The Call to Reject GM6, the third sentence, he reads, and I quote, We wish to reiterate the facts that the improved yield and sustained food security will rather inure to the benefit of farmers rather than impoverish them as speculating in the media. This is a position that he has taken already. Mm -hmm. So how can a regulator tell us that the GMC that are yet to be approved, he can assure us that to give farmers improved yield? That's the position he has taken already. Mm -hmm. And we've been part of a lot of stakeholder workshops where the NBA's position is more of a promoter than a regulator. So the statements he's making now that he, they, are, they are just regulators, it, it doesn't wash. And the fact that it was first published by one gentleman, the fact is that the news broke out in the Ghanaian media space through a foreign journal and not through the NBA. Okay. And that's a fact. The third point is that when it comes to... And issues, please make that the final point. Yes, please. When it comes to issues of food security, Ghana's aim is to be a net exporter of major staples, including maize and soya. So I don't know why the MB is interested in allowing the importation of GM soya into the country. And then my last point. Last year, we had a soya bean stakeholder validation workshop where all the soya bean actors in the country, from farmers to processors to marketers, were there. And we all agreed that looking at the premium price that soya fetches, that's the non-GM soya, Ghana should tread on a path of cultivation and promoting non-GM soya to attract premium prices. Mm. So even the soya industry is well in support of what non-GM. So which company is he saying that they have told, told him that they prefer GM? They, they, should, they should come again. In fact, right. there are statements mm. with this more question than others. Okay. And just before I go, uh, in the next few minutes or so, we'll be having a press conference for our colleagues on this same issue and other issues will come out very well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Tanko Bagbara, PRO for Minister of Agriculture. Your final words, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think that uh, the statement from the National Biosafety Authority has been stated as, as a ministry that certainly uh, it's not meant for planting, or it's not meant for cultivation, and I think we draw something from that. Uh, but personally, this is my personal ground check. You see, any time you more expansion, the ordinary Ghanaian gets panic. What is it about GMO? Can the scientists do as the honor of educating us whether GMO products are harmful or they are good? We need, as an ordinary guy, to get the understanding of what GMO products are. But I want to believe, again, at my personal level, that if you look at most of our supermarkets, we are consuming GMO products. It is there. We are consuming it as a country already. And I want to conclude that certainly the, the ministry has the authority to issue permits for import and export of, uh, let me say, plant and animal products. And to the best of uh, my knowledge, no request has been brought before the ministry uh, requesting for any permit to import. Uh, so far, we haven't seen sex. Mm. So we need to uh, earlier of years, as far as farmers are concerned, that we are not using GMO products as planting materials. Thank you. Thank you. Tanko Bagbara, who is a PRO for Ministry of Agriculture. In the studio with us is uh, Bismarck Tete, Executive Director of Peasant Farmers Association. But uh, Benjamin... You're wrapping it up. You want to share some final words on this? Oh, no. I am done on this. We also had uh, Edward Carraway of the yeah. Agricultural yeah. Workers Union uh, joining right. the conversation. And, of course, mm -hmm. Mr. Corrier of the Biosafety uh, Authority as well. We're grateful to all of you gentlemen, including Mr. Tete uh, in uh, the studio. Uh, do stay with us. There's still a lot more action coming your way before we wrap it up on the AM show.
It's still the AM show on Joy News. Now, let me tell you about SIC Life Insurance. You know they were the sponsors for Ghana Month on Hits. And let's have a conversation with the manager for SIC Mall, also a branch under the SIC Life Insurance. Joining me in the studio is Kwesi Poku, manager for SIC Mall. Kwesi Poku, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Great. So briefly, tell me about your company and the services that you offer. SIC Life mm. Insurance is a life company. Um, we do basically with insuring your, the human being. Uh, we have products right from childbirth until you die. Um, we also have group products for um, schools, mm. for churches, for associations. Right. That helps in mitigating risk. You know, in this life, it's all about risk. Yes. So one way or the other of reducing the risk you have on yourself is to do life insurance. Okay. So SIC Life, that is basically what we do. People have money because you sponsored Ghana Month on it. <laughs> or well, what, what informed your decision to sponsor Ghana Month on it? Uh, in fact, SIC Life mm. is a 100% Ghanaian-owned company. Okay. With 80% being government, 20% being SIC insurance. Okay. So looking at Ghana Month, we are talking about Ghana, promoting Ghana, letting people see the good things we have. And one of the good things we have is SIC Life okay. Insurance. What about the mall? The mall is as a result of uh, prudent advice and investment. Mm. You know, when your money comes to SIC Life, even if you die, mm. your next of kin can take your coupon, can take your insurance card, and come and say, uh, my mother saved with you, and therefore the person is entitled to some money. Okay. So the management came up with the idea in spreading our investments. Why don't we also build a mall right in the heart of Accra Central? In the corner down there. Huh? In the corner down there. <laughs> so unfortunately, yeah. we, can, we can't see yeah. it. Mm. But um, it's a good investment in the sense that Accra Central is the place where everybody wants to shop. But one thing that in going through trying to put up this mall, we realized was, you know, there's so much hassle going about in Accra Central that at times it deters people from um, coming to Accra Central to shop. Hmm. So we have built this... Uh, lively mall when you enter we have a basement car park okay so you easily park climb upstairs do your shopping in a hassle-free environment right so we are encouraging people anytime they come to accra central come to sic life mall okay. come and shop are you currently running any discounts for your customers and our audience i mean we all like a discount um the, the discounts that we did with Hits FM mm. um, was that we gave coupons to 10 uh, customers okay. to come and shop at 250 CDs mm. worth. So we have also talked to all the tenants in the shop. They are happy to receive anyone who has the coupon. So we are still Are you still giving out those coupons or it's over? Um, well, um, it's over, but they haven't shopped yet. Ah, okay. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> we are still encouraging them. Right. Please come. Come with your coupons. Come and shop. Uh, we'll be happy to serve you mm. so that they can also spread the good news that they came to shop in a hassle-free environment right in the heart of Accra. Okay. I'm sure there are some of our audience who would like to get in touch with you. So can you share your contact details or how to get in touch with SIC Mall and SIC Life Insurance? Okay. Um, the first thing is, the moment you get to Accra Central, mm. you just ask anybody, I want to go to SIC Life Mall. Okay. They will direct. Mm -hmm. But if you are coming in a car, you can pass through the high street, Turn, take a, a right turn mm. in between the court and then GCB Bank okay. and drive all the way towards the Presby Church. 
Okay. We are just directly opposite the Presby Church. Okay. Uh, if you want to contact, uh, you can call 0244 Right. And then you get I want you to do that one more time so that it's ingrained in the, in the minds of our audience. <laughs> So I, this I, is your I, I say it once okay. again. 0244-983336. Right. Thank you so much, Kwesi Poku, manager of SIC Mall. And uh, hopefully I can get that coupon another time. But um, Benjamin and I are back in just a minute to wrap up like we do. And then we'll bring you the photo of the day. Stay with us for just a minute. Welcome back, and uh, it's been quite a show this yeah. morning. But like we do, right before we leave, would you like to tell us about our photo of the day? Well, I think it will be a surprise to me because I haven't <laughs> seen it yet. So, okay, so show we're us heading there. to Jamestown, and we're okay. going to splash that photo on. Fisher folk going about their daily Aww. activity. Uh, my own curiosity, though, has to do with the fact that if you watch carefully, you see some childlike entities in there. Mm. Which tells you about the reality of our fishing yeah. industry and uh, some of the things we talk about, um, yeah. you know, child labor. I mean, definitely when you're looking at some of these ones, apart from the gentleman in the middle. So yeah. to your left, one, two, three, four. All of those are, well, maybe not the fourth. I, I can't see him well, but these three. Can I, you guess see, I, I see communal spirits. And I think this is actually a real representation of the reality. When they come back, the children or the women sometimes, even join them to, you know, mend, mend the, nets, the nets, take the fishes out and all that. So a beautiful photo there by the Caleb Mensa, always bringing you spectacular shots of what's happening in this country and uh, a lot more. Benjamin well, we've brought you a spectacular <laughs> view of the Corey's news this morning on the air. Yeah. So it's time now for us to knock off and the Joy News Desk crew will take over from Sweetie Abochi and... Benjamin Akapo, it's been real. Thank you for watching. See you again tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>